G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Caliper CBD a shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, do you guys ever feel like you need to take more care of yourself? And do you ever wonder why it needs to be so hard? Well, meet Caliper, a better way to consume CBD. With Caliper, not only does it help you feel better without making drastic changes to your routine, but also, unlike CBD oils, Caliper powder is completely tasteless and mixes easily in any food or drink. There's no weird taste or oily residue that hangs around, and with precisely 20 milligrams in each packet, you never have to question how much CBD you're taking. It's also been clinically proven now that you absorb 450% more CBD with the Caliper CBD powder compared to tinctures, which is crazy, right? I've personally put it in my tea before I go to sleep, and it's really helped me with getting a good night's rest, which for me is pretty amazing. Also, just so you guys know, Caliper CBD is actually completely THC free, which means that you get all the goodness of CBD without worrying about the high. And with the individual packets provided, it's never been easier to gain those benefits wherever you go. So, get 20% off your first order when you use promo code SCARED at trycaliper.com SCARED. You can try Caliper CBD risk-free for 30 days. If you don't love it, they'll give you a full refund. That's trycaliper.com slash scared. And don't forget to use the promo code scared for 20% off your first order. My mother once told me that flies were Satan's messengers, but I didn't quite understand what she meant until... Well, I was faced with an event that showed me just how true that statement actually was. So, when my son was very young, his father Mike and I worked for a real estate company as head maintenance and painting in the desert of Palmdale, California. We were having problems with some tenants at our apartment stealing tools and equipment from our garage, so the owner of the company that we worked for, he told us that there was a small house at the edge of town that needed some work in cleaning up. He said the prior tenants up and left after two years without saying a word, leaving everything behind inside this house, the garage, and in the back of the property. And all we had to do was throw away some trash, some minor repairs, and some painting. By the time that we were done, he said that there was a unit becoming available behind Mike's parents' place, and we could have that instead if we wanted. And we were excited to get the heck out of this hole that we were in, and even though we would be working during our stay there, we had a place for our dogs to run, which we were grateful for. It all happened pretty quick too. No sooner did our things go into storage, our boss was calling us to go out there. The house was old and sat back from the road. There was one lonely street light shining in the front and a large construction dumpster placed on the side of the property. And it took us a while to make the place habitable at best. I told Mike, Wow, the former tenants really did leave everything behind from food on the stove to clothes in the closets. They must have been in some hurry, huh? But at least they left some nice furniture, I suppose. And the first couple of weeks were different. You know, all the creaks of uh, an old house kind of different. But the longer that we stayed, the clearer it was why the tenants left as abruptly as they did. Now, my son Cody's room was right across from ours, and sometimes in the middle of the night, he would just start groaning. I would go in there, only to find his legs over the foot of his bed, him still asleep, and the blankets on the floor. I just figured that he must have wiggled down, so I would tuck him back into bed, and that would be that. One morning, he was sitting in the kitchen eating a bowl of cereal while I was fixing the drawer, and he started telling me about this little boy in his room. I thought that he was talking about a dream, but he looked dead in my face and insisted that it was real. You see, my son had a very active imagination growing up, and he talked to everything, even his shoes, so this wasn't totally unusual to me, and I didn't think too much about it. But there were a few things going on that I couldn't explain. Strange things, but not scary at the time. Like... I woke up with a small red circle the size of a nickel on the upper part of my arms that later turned into a bruise, and Mike had scratches down his back that he didn't even know where they were until I pointed them out. 
And I think because we were so focused on getting this house and the property done, we just weren't really paying attention to anything that might be paranormal. Plus, Mike didn't believe in all that sort of stuff anyway. But later that week, I was up early painting the French door, separating the living room from the hall to the bedrooms, when my son came out of his room crying. I rushed over and picked him up and brought him over to the couch to calm him down and find out what was wrong. I thought maybe that he must have just had a bad dream. But his cry was different. But between skips of each breath, he told me that the boy in his room got big and turned into a huge monster. He was grabbing his foot, so I looked down and what I saw was just humanly impossible. The end of his sock was twisted so hard that it was stiff and hard to pull off his foot. His big toe was purple and there was a small cut where the other toenail had dug into it. In fact, it was so extreme that I was surprised that it wasn't actually broken. And, oh my goodness, this was terrifying. And there was just no way, no matter what Mike said, was I going to let him sleep in that room ever again. All doubt was gone at this point. There was definitely something in that house and I had to stay on my guard. I called my mother soon and I told her what had happened because she knew a lot more about this stuff than I did. And she told me to go out and get some sage and salt and cleanse the house as soon as possible. So that's exactly what I did. Later that day, despite Mike making fun of me, I cleansed every room and we got ready for bed. Mike on one side, me on the other and Cody in the middle now. Now, I would say maybe about 20 minutes after I fell asleep, it felt like a slap on my cheek with a voice that screamed, wake up in my ear, woke me up. I sat straight up too, and then I hit Mike and told him to get up, and he grumbled a minute, opened his eyes wide, and I swear to you that the whole house was just vibrating. At first we thought that it was actually an earthquake, but it didn't stop. It was a pulsating vibration. Even the chain on the ceiling fan was moving. The logical thought was maybe it was the pipes under the house, but the pipes were located at the other end of the house, and the house was on a cement slab, and the water heater was outside. And just then, Mike jumped up, grabbing the bat next to the bed, and ran out the room, scaring the crap out of me. He said that he saw the reflection of a deformed face in the glass of the French doors in the living room, so he thought that it was an intruder. And eventually, he came back confused and sat on the end of the bed. That night, we laid there, feeling the house shake and moan until eventually we just all fell asleep. The next morning, Mike was talking with a friend on the phone, and the first thing out of his friend's mouth was, maybe the house is haunted. He gave me a look like, perhaps there might be something to this paranormal thing, but I sort of dismissed it. A week passed, and needless to say, that we were on edge, but the house was almost done. Only the garage and the property were left to do now. It was a Sunday, and my mother, who had my other five kids for the summer, thought that she would make the trip over to the hill to see us on their way back from church one day. She said that the closer that they got, the more she had the feeling of just dread overtake her. When they arrived, the kids flooded from the van, gave kisses and hugs, and then ran out the back to play with the dogs. My mother and elder sister came in and sat down in the living room. Everything was fine, but this look came over my mother's face. She said, Do you smell something? It smells like something dead. I didn't at the time, but the smell eventually took over the whole house, and flies just started showing up in droves. And for the life of us, we couldn't figure out where they were coming from. Mike looked all around for a dead rodent or something, but there was no reason for it. We closed all the vents and the windows, but somehow they just kept coming and completely covering the ceiling and the hallway and down the walls like a, a thick fog. And then Mum said that whatever was in this house didn't want them there. Because, you see... My mother was very spiritual, and people often referred to her as a beacon of light, and I felt like maybe she was right about it, not wanting her there, but before she could get up and cut the visit short, her eyes got heavy and she felt really drained. 
She said that she didn't understand what was wrong with herself and because my sister couldn't drive, my mother went down to lay down in the van for a bit. In the meantime, the kids came in and after the initial shock of seeing the living room and the kitchen being taken over by flies, we made a bit of a game of it. We took the shop vac and a vacuum and sucked the flies right out of the air and off the ceiling and I remember filling up about two bags full and a half a canister with flies. And after making some fun of it, it started to get late and I knew that my mother wanted to get on the road before dark so I sent my sister out to the van to get her. My mum walked up the driveway slowly, stopping a few times along the way. But when she came in, she just said that she couldn't make that long drive feeling the way that she did, so I made some food and told her and my sister to sleep in my room and the rest of us hunkered down with sleeping bags in the living room, occasionally getting up in the night to kill flies. Nobody wanted to sleep in my son's room, that was for sure, and I wasn't about to let it happen either. But the next morning after a restless night for all of us, I asked my mother to take my youngest son with them, not only for his safety, but so we could finish this job and just get out of here. And honestly, I thought that he was going to be upset leaving me, but he was really happy to get out of there, and to be honest, I didn't blame him one bit. But the most surprising thing was that 30 minutes after they pulled out of the driveway, every fly in the house went away, and not one behind. That was really strange. Anyway, my mum called after they got home and she said that and that didn't surprise her. The work around the house was coming to an end thanks to a few friends reluctantly coming over to help too, so all that was left was the outside of the garage now. On this day, my friend Bonnie and her boyfriend came over to help and she had heard so many stories that I think curiosity got the best of her, having studied the occult and... We were working in the garage and the guys were working outside. The garage was packed with dust covered boxes and just random junk all over the place. There was a thick layer of sort of desert sand too and dirt on the floor. It felt dark and ominous in there and despite it being in the middle of summer it was noticeably cool as well which we didn't mind at all but it was a bit strange. After we got all the boxes out we started pulling things off the shelves there must have been around 12 glass jars various sizes with brown liquid in them and something floating inside of them too that we couldn't figure out what it was. The lids were sealed with like red and black wax and what looked like hair was wrapped around the lid. I told her to just put them down in the end and finish cleaning so we could get the heck out of here. So she climbed on the bench and started emptying the cabinets while I swept the floor. And... It sort of looked like there was paint on the ground underneath all that dirt. And just then she said, ooh. I stopped sweeping and went over to where she was to see what she was referring to. She asked me to give her a flashlight and she started pulling out some pretty weird things. Like a crow's beak, a chicken claw, a bottle cap and what looked like brownish red dried ink and long feather riding quills and some human teeth as well. I told her to toss that stuff and just went on sweeping. And as I was looking down, it looked like the floor was moving, so I asked her to toss me the flashlight. When I lit up the floor, I noticed that it was maggots all over where I was standing, so I screamed and jumped on a stool. And well, my scream startled her, so she jerked and knocked over one of the jars and it went crashing down where I was sweeping and... The liquid washed away some of the dirt revealing a pentagram painted on the floor and what looked like some sort of animal embryo, that's the best I can describe it as too, came out of the broken jar. The hair on my arm instantly raised and at this we both ran out of there as quickly as we could and refused to go back in there. We worked in the yard and left the garage and everything in it up to the guys we never slept in that house after that day. But we stayed at Bonnie's mother's house and moved into our new place just a few weeks later. Which I was very, very grateful for. Also, just as a little side note, my son, who is 25 now, was actually sort of reading through this as I was writing it. And he said that he actually remembers those times, despite being so young. And years later, the kids, they all remember sucking the flies from the air and having heaps of fun, but they don't really remember why it all happened, which I guess is probably a good thing.
So a bit of backstory first. As with most students, I was always broke and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. And one of them was house and pet city. I've always had a love for animals, so when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned from their overseas trip, as the last sitter had bailed on them and their six-month-old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I practically jumped at the opportunity. And the fact that they promised to pay me the full two-week fee for staying there less than a week made it so much more appealing. Little did I know, though, just how bad it would all turn out in the end. I got the details though, got the keys from the agent and headed over to the house as it was already after 5pm and almost dark as it was early spring. I got to the house which was a really nice place but it bordered a not so good area that was and still is prone to crime, house break-ins, robberies, stuff like that. It didn't bother me too much though because, you know, nothing bad will happen to me. I know, young and naive. But the first four nights, they went without a hitch. Just watching movies, jacuzzi, and just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day, fairly late at night. And I went over to check on the doggo. I got a call from them at about 10pm saying that their flight got delayed. They were going to stay in a hotel and do the three and a half hour drive back the following morning. And also asked if I could sleep there again that night. Which was fine with me, I mean, I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. So I called my dad to let him know of the plans, as I was still staying with my parents, and he specifically asked what the address was. Now, I normally didn't give details like that because, well, I was old enough to look after myself after all. But I still believe to this day that that is probably exactly what saved my life. Anyway... I eventually got to bed at about 1am and it felt like I would have only slept about 5 minutes I think when I was awoken to a window breaking and I could hear movement and what sounded like footsteps running down the hallway. The first thing I did was grab my phone and I just hit redial thanks to my old Motorola phone. Redialing was as simple as pressing one button as my dad was the last number that I had called hoping that he would wake up from the call. I then dropped the phone in between the headboard and the mattress in case my dad picked up and he can hear what was going on. And I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see a silhouette and he had a knife in his hand. And when he saw me, he raised it and he came straight at me. Now, one thing to those that are unfamiliar with South Africa and the crime is that robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent here. People get murdered or even tortured if they in the slightest retaliate or don't cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me, and when he came within reach, I just kicked both legs out as hard as I could. Now, I'm not a small guy. I'm like 6'3", and at that stage, I weighed about 100 kilos or 220 pounds, and I was fit and really strong. My time not spent at the uni or work was at the gym pretty much, and I could do an easy 250 pound bench, 350 pound squat, and when I kicked and made contact with this guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily too, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get back up, I was on top of him, driving my knee into his face and in return his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on it at this point, so I put in some extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes, thankfully, but before I could get up, I heard the sound of a pistol cock, and I immediately froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body, and I became just numb. I remember, too, the only thing that went through my head was that if he shot me, that I would rather die than be disabled or dependent on other people that will have to take care of me. He stood like that too with the pistol against my head for what felt like hours, but was probably less than 10 seconds. I didn't move, I didn't even flinch, and he eventually said in very broken English to get on the bed, face down. I panicked, but thought that if he wanted to shoot me that he already would have, so I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me, and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall, just so that if he wanted to stab me that... I had my legs and arms in front of me to protect my body. 
Now, by that time, I had forgotten all about the fact that I had called my dad, and the guy that I'd need is still down. And then I heard a third guy come into the room, and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me, I think. I couldn't understand what they said, obviously, but I sort of recognized it, as we used to go to Mozambique on holidays a lot, and that's the main language spoken there. The guy tried to get this guy that I had put down off the ground, while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a big bag. It was about at this time, too, that I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mac 1. The car skidded to a halt right in front of the gate, and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. Now, I know my dad missed them on purpose because if he wanted to actually hit them, he probably would have, as he is not one of, if not the best shot that I've ever known. And I'm not saying that just because he's my dad. He is actually ex-Army Special Forces, represented South Africa in the Clay Pigeon World Championship a couple of years ago, has various regional pistol and rifle championship titles, and is a gunsmith by occupation. I've actually seen him hit golf balls at like 50 meters away with his pistol. But politics and the racial situation in the country at the moment would have had him in big trouble had he had actually hit one of them. I quickly grabbed the house keys though and I pressed the gate remote and my dad called the police while he came in and I met him at the front door and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there too. There's some excuses of no vehicles available but by the time I had calmed down and started to look for the dog, I unfortunately couldn't find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard and as I got to the corner, I could see her there, laying on the ground. I got to her, and unfortunately, she was dead. Later autopsies, too, revealed that she was actually poisoned, and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning, believe it or not, is actually a pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or that area that is targeted for a break-in or a robbery. And man... I was fuming, and really sad too. The police were also pretty useless to be honest, and had a I don't care sort of attitude, and barely even took our statements. By that time it was starting to get light, and I retrieved my bag, my phone, and I locked the house as good as I could without touching anything, and I drove home behind my dad. And only when I got home did I get the story from my dad's side. He said that he answered my call, only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on, and when I didn't respond, he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily too, he asked me for the address the previous night, and he knows the area well to know exactly which house it is. Now, like I mentioned, my dad got there pretty quickly, and he said that he stayed on the line the whole time, only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents' house is about 10 kilometers or maybe 6 miles from there, through a residential area, and it's normally about a 20-minute drive. The call duration, though, was only 7 minutes and 13 seconds, so you can imagine just how quickly he was driving. I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, and they took fingerprints, etc., and the owners got back about the same time. And the rest of the day was just a complete blur because I was coming down from the shock and the adrenaline, I think. Now, as surprising as it may be, this is not where the story actually ends. Because about seven or eight months later, I got a call from the detective telling me that they actually caught the guys and I have to come up for a lineup to point them out. I specifically told her that I didn't actually see any of their faces as it was really dark and after the guy held the gun against my head I was under the blanket and didn't see anything but she assured me that they caught them on fingerprints and will show them to me beforehand which might not be the ethically correct way to do it I think but they wanted to have as much evidence as possible against them I guess but you'll understand why in a minute. So I got to the police station and unlike you see in the movies there's no one-way glass or separate room. They just bring the three guys into the room and make them stand against the wall. The one which I was later told was the leader, which was the one that I had need, looked at me with so much hate as I had never seen in my life, but he had the eyes of someone that would slit your throat and not even blink an eye, to be honest. 
His name was Joseph, Dragon Sambo. He pulled his hand up to his neck and made the slit my throat gesture. You know which one I mean. We left the room and the detective gave me a copy of his rap sheet. And amongst others, there were four counts of murder. I think eight or nine attempted murders too. Multiple assaults, aggravated assault, over a hundred house break-ins and robbery, and even some rape. I obviously was very shocked, and the detective told me that had I not have taken him out first and fast that night, I would have definitely not gotten away so lightly. Now, this is also not where the story ends, because three days later, I get another call from the detective saying that I should be careful as he had escaped from custody and they hadn't caught him yet. I wasn't worried too much, I suppose, as the robbery wasn't actually at my house and I had changed cars so he probably couldn't find me. Also, I had got my firearm license and I was now carrying a pistol on me like 24-7. And I didn't hear anything after that for quite a long time. In fact, it was only about two years later, I think, when I saw the detective in the grocery shop. We started talking about the case and she told me that he was actually killed during a home invasion. But I guess that in the end this whole ordeal has made me just so much more vigilant, heightened my situational awareness too and made me a little more paranoid to double and triple check all doors and locks etc. That's for sure. Also, thanks to my heightened situational awareness, it's allowed me to remove myself from a few potential dangerous situations in the years after this incident too, which I'm actually thankful for. But it's also robbed me of my peace of mind, which that sort of sucks I guess, but I have since immigrated to a safer country, but I still sometimes wake up at night if I hear a noise. It's annoying, but it is what it is. Anyway, if you got this far, then thanks for listening and stay safe out there, guys, because you just never know what might come your way. So I'm a 23-year-old female, and this story is about a 33-year-old man, his name was Greg, who I met at the gym a year back. So, I used to go to the gym with my mother, and being introvert, I very seldom used to engage with or even talk to people. Being in the gym since the last two years, I had seen Greg work out and never really caught him staring or even looking at me. He's a well-educated, well-spoken guy, and I assume that interacting with him won't pose any threat to me. But one day, Greg walks up to me at the gym and asks to add me on Facebook so he could promote some things regarding his business. I didn't think much of it as I'm barely active on the platform anyway and I let him add me. And slowly our interactions grew in the gym as well as on social media. I was going through a rough patch so I would often find myself looking for a friend or even more sometimes. And from the very beginning my mother did not like Greg because she felt that something was off about him. Nevertheless I chose to meet him and other mutual friends from ours from the gym for coffee. I wasn't strongly romantically inclined towards Greg, but wasn't overtly opposed to it either. At coffee, our conversations were quite general, but on text, Greg would occasionally flirt with me, but I would just ignore it, which in the end was actually a big mistake. You see, the more I spoke to Greg, the more I realized that I don't see any kind of future with him, even as a friend. Eventually, I started backing off and took longer and longer to reply to his texts. I didn't want to blatantly snub him because well, we went to the same gym and I wanted to avoid any hostility. And that was another big mistake too, but Greg also slowly backed off and eventually we just stopped talking. Fast forward though about six months and I got my dream job and posted about it on Facebook. Greg congratulated me and told me that he was proud of me. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt and started replying to his texts. He again began making flirtatious remarks towards me, but this time I blatantly told him that this makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to be involved with him romantically or sexually. Subsequently, the conversation died down and we parted on cordial terms. He would text me messages asking for feedback for some of his work regarding music, but I would generally ignore them. Now, in July of this year, 
Greg messages me asking for feedback, but with another message asking whether I would like to withdraw from his broadcast list for feedbacks. I respectfully told him that I would like to withdraw since I don't see myself as being qualified enough for giving appropriate feedback anyway. He went off on the messages, most of which I didn't understand. I asked for context and he told me that I'm only getting that over call. I agreed to call. Another mistake. But we spoke for two hours wherein I made it very clear to him that I see him only as a friend and if he wants to pursue anything more he's barking up the wrong tree. He complied and was very respectful throughout. I assumed that there was no harm in talking to him as a friend. For a couple of weeks we spoke as friends too and perhaps as future work partners for a music venture. I was hesitant I'll admit and I would shoot his invitations to meet down by making excuses all the time. He was understanding though and told me to take my time. After about three weeks of being friends though, Greg comes clean about his intentions and lets me know that he is attracted to me. He began making sexual remarks towards me which made me very uncomfortable and I told him that now I don't feel comfortable to meet him since we're not on the same page at all. He was agitated by that but told me that if I wouldn't meet him that he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. And quite honestly, I thought to myself good riddance as I was getting increasingly tired of him calling me every day anyway and telling me about his inflated self-image. He told me that he'll contact me after a year and he would meet then if I reconsidered my feelings towards him, but I obliged since I was growing patient and I just wanted him out of my life at this point. I was off my phone that day for about six to seven hours and when I came online, I was welcomed with numerous missed calls and messages, some of which were actually threatening in nature. He threatened to show up to my house and hurt me and my family. And this is when I realized that I may need to involve my family and the police. I told my parents the whole story and they didn't immediately contact the police because these could just be empty threats from a man who doesn't take no for an answer. But the following day, Greg bombarded my parents with threatening messages claiming that he was going to abduct me if they won't marry me to him. It was at this point too that we contacted the police. The police went to Greg's home to investigate but seeing his behavior, he was on the roof half naked yelling obscenities. They declared him mentally unfit and told us that he can't be arrested. We withdrew the complaint and contacted higher law authorities and while we were awaiting a response, Greg allegedly committed a crime in a five-star hotel. He assaulted a female employee and a guest with a knife and tried to molest the employee. Consequently, an FIR was filed which led to Greg being admitted into a mental institution. He stayed there for a few days and now he walks free. We were able to file another complaint against him which was taken more seriously this time but we were advised not to create a case against him as he's not as much committed a crime against me and would easily get off on bail in the end. And so, as much as it sucks, he still roams free and still continues to contact me from unknown numbers once in a while making me feel like I'm under constant threat outside of my house. When I was little, around six to seven years old, I used to go with my family to a house in the woods in West Virginia. I really loved it from the view to the atmosphere too. It should also be noted that the closest house was like 20 minutes away I think. But we went there very often, to which I considered myself a boy scout because I loved to go in little by little and knowing small shortcuts and others. I liked to climb trees and see the sunsets and how the sun faded. Until one day when it was no more than five minutes to the house when I was up in my favorite tree and I hear some branches breaking but very slowly and not so far away too I heard something big moving. I heard my mother call my name which was very strange of her because at least she does it when she's angry but I was excited at first since I wanted to show her how I climbed trees and which was my favorite. And the emotion ran through me too until she called me again, but this time in a stronger tone. And I don't know what it was, but something inside of me took over and my instinct kicked in, I think. 
It was as if, in my subconscious, it made me say, come down and go home. And every time I heard it get louder and closer, it was as if the sound came from just everywhere. When I eventually lowered my little legs from the tree, I heard the most horrible scream that I will never forget as long as I live. It was a twisted and deep scream, and it said my name again, and this time, I ran as quickly as I could to the house. While I was running too and moving some of the branches, I could have sworn that I heard breaking too as if something was following me until the sound just suddenly stopped and followed or something let out a very loud scream like that of a bear combined with a lion and when I got to the house eventually, my mother saw me with a frightened face and said, your pants, because unfortunately I had peed my pants. I said to her, did you call me, panting and gasping for breath, and she said no. From there, I told her everything, and at first she didn't believe me so much, but when I grew up, she told me that something very strange was happening out there. Since that time, I have never climbed a tree or entered that forest alone. And to this day, I still sometimes talk to my mum about this, about what that sound was, and the fact that she was calling me and I could have sworn that it was her but there was all the movements and the cracking in the branches and something big obviously moving in all of the underbrush but I couldn't make out what the heck it was. All I know is that I think I was lucky to get away from something that was obviously trying to lure me in. So this happened close to 20 years ago. I was visiting my parents at their house for a week sometime in late spring, early summer. One morning, my mum woke me up and asked me to come out to the front yard to look at something. Her tone sort of tipped me off to the fact that she was unnerved by whatever it was that she found. She was standing at the end of our sidewalk when I joined her, where she pointed to something where the sidewalk abutted the driveway. Is that what I think it is? It was a trail of blood, or, or drying blood. I could see a few spatters of blood sort of trailing out into the unpaved driveway, but they were hard to discern against the reddish clay, that is, and the sand of the driveway. I soon lost the trail, although the general trajectory was toward the road in front of the house. At the other end of the trail led down where the sidewalk turned to run toward the gate between the house and the garage. Enough blood had been lost, too, for there to be large splotches visible on the borders of the sidewalk as well as on the small patch of lawn between the sidewalk and the north side of the house, too. The trail led to the holy edge that grows next to the house, and some of the branches on one of the bushes were bent and broken, the leaves smeared with blood, as was the side of the house behind the holy bush. And there was a sizable, maybe 10-inch, 12-inch, across stain on the soil beneath it. The ivy on the fence next to the bush was also splattered, with some leaves entirely coated with blood. For context too, my parents' house is in a small town. The house and the garage are separate structures, with an ivy-covered chain-link fence running between the house and the garage to separate the front yard from the back. The lot faces the main north-south road through the town, while behind the lot is a street that runs north between their lot and the neighbor's house, then makes a sharp turn to the west, away from my parents' yard. Following that street leads you to another neighborhood on the right, while the left side of the street is bordered by a heavily wooded area that eventually connects with a large swath of mostly unpopulated forest and swamp. And from the amount of blood by the holy, we judged that someone had hidden there for at least a little while. Some of the ivy was pulled away from the fence between the house and the garage too, so it was clear that this person had climbed over the fence. From there, the trail became much more clear as it went across the concrete patio between the house and the garage. There's a window or AC unit sticking out from the window just past that fence and on the other side of it, there was so much more blood drying in a pool on the patio as well as more smears higher up on the wall of the house. Again too, it looked like the person had hidden there behind the AC unit for a while and, and by this point, we were certain that it was a person and not an animal partly because of the sheer amount of blood and partly because of the smears on the side of the house were way up higher, as if a person had leaned against the house with blood on their hands or upper body. But the trail then picked up again, but with smaller spatters, as if they had managed to control the bleeding somewhat. 
The track went across the patio and out into the backyard, where it was difficult to follow through the grass. But at the far back fence, some of the honeysuckle vines that grew over the fence had been pulled and the fence was bent, as if someone had climbed over it, and again there were some smears of blood on the vines. From there, the trail ran out into the street behind my parents' house, where it became nearly impossible to follow. It was pretty clear that someone had been injured and was also trying to hide, which implied that someone else had caused the injury and was looking for them. Whatever the injury was, it must have been fairly serious because they lost a lot of blood in my parents' yard alone. They had come down the driveway from the main road and they clearly knew that they could cut through the yard to reach the back street and the neighborhood of the forest beyond. But my dad asked the night security guard at the local school if he had heard anything on the police scanners that night about anything weird going on, but the guard hadn't heard anything. But my mum told me a few days later that the neighbour who lives on the street behind them told her that he'd actually had insomnia that night and had heard someone running down the street around 3 in the morning and also had seen a, a dark coloured truck make several slow passes up and down the street. I asked my parents if they wanted to call the police to report, well, whatever this is, but they are both in their late 60s at that time and I worried about them being alone while there were creepy things, presumably involving violence, that were clearly going on right outside of their house. My mum declined though, not only because there was nothing the police could actually do, but also because she worried the police might actually become involved somehow with what had happened. The local cops here have a bit of a reputation for being corrupt and she didn't want to have any sort of involvement with them. So I eventually just took a hose and a scrub brush and I did my best to wash away all traces of whatever it was that happened that previous night. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well for the remainder of that trip home, nor on subsequent visits. It kind of was like being in a house in a slasher film. Not the house where the actual violence takes place, but the one down the street where the hero or heroine of the movie runs and hides outside while being pursued by the killer, and the neighbor only finds out the next morning, off screen, that something bad was happening just outside while they slept. It was definitely a creepy feeling, and much closer than I ever want to be to that kind of situation again. This happened to me about five years ago, I think, so some details are a bit fuzzy, but I'm sharing this exactly how I remember it. So when I was in high school, I was best friends with this girl called Sarah. Sarah and I were practically inseparable, and Sarah was what you would consider the cool girl. She was charismatic, spontaneous, rebellious, confident, and incredibly beautiful. She was also somewhat of a bad influence, though. Don't get me wrong, she never pressured me into doing anything that I wasn't comfortable with, i.e. drinking, smoking, older boys, and all that sort of stuff. But she did bring me into some questionable situations, to say the least. But I truly loved her and cherished our friendship. She was the sister that I really never had, and I'm the eldest child and the only girl born to Eastern European immigrants, so naturally, I grew up in a very strict and controlling household. I realized my parents were only like this to try and protect me, but were feeling so caged only made me want to venture out more, really. And this itch to be rebellious is what I think caused my lapse of judgment to agree to Sarah's plan that night. So it was a summer break between my junior and senior year of high school. Our mutual friend Riley, an amateur photographer, Sarah's boyfriend Ryan, and their friend Cherry and myself were all sleeping over Sarah's house already a rare occurrence because of how strict my parents were. We were all chilling though on the couch just watching ghost adventures when Sarah was telling us about an episode that she was watching earlier about this place called The Domes in Arizona. She was telling us how there was supposedly a satanic cult that practiced there and how we should go and check it out. But we live southeast of Phoenix and would be able to get there in about 45 minutes. I looked at my phone's clock and saw that it was about 10 p.m. And this is where I should have objected, but I wanted to do something cool and adventurous, so I said yes. Everyone was excited and grabbed their supplies and piled into my crappy 2005 Golda Honda Accord. And to get to the domes, you need to drive in the middle of the desert. And anyone who lives in the desert knows just how creepy it can be at night. 
Maybe it was the dark, desolate highway. Maybe it was the realization of what we were going to do, or maybe my guardian angel telling me that I'm a dumbass, but I started to just get really nervous about this trip. My thighs were shaking, and I just had this gut feeling that we should not be going to this place. I tried to voice my concerns as well, but everyone said that I was being paranoid and basically just told me to shut up and drive. We finally got off the highway though and drove on a dirt road for a few miles until we pulled up to a chain link fence with a gap in it. I pulled the car around so it was facing the exit just in case we needed a speedy getaway and as soon as I parked Sarah, Cherry and Ryan all jumped out and started walking through the fence. Riley hopped out too but waited about five feet from the car for me so I wouldn't have to walk alone. I was hiding everyone's valuables because my car's locking mechanism was actually broken and all the locks need to be manually opened. Since I already had a bad feeling about this place, I opted to keep the doors unlocked just in case we needed to all get in quickly. As I was hiding their stuff, I had the sudden urge to look to my left. Across the street was a tall line of hedges and there appeared to be a man standing in the shadows just watching me. For some reason, this didn't immediately spark terror in me. Instead, I was just kind of curious and a bit confused. I was wondering if he actually lived around the area or if it was just a, a human-shaped shadow or something. But I looked at this thing for about three seconds until I finished what I was doing and go out to join Riley. When I got to her, I asked, did you see that man? But Riley, confused, replied with, what man? I didn't see anybody. So, in the end, I just kind of shrugged it off and we started walking. We needed to walk about an eighth of a mile on dirt to get to the domes, and if you Google the Grande domes, pictures should come up, but I'll describe them anyways. So, there are multiple concrete domes in this center, and they vary in shape. I remember one that stood alone was UFO-shaped, while others were more circular and kind of connected. The domes appeared to be abandoned while they were still being built and had been standing there for quite some time. They were made of concrete, but covered in graffiti, and most had chunks of the ceiling missing as the brutal Arizona sun had wore it down, so much in fact that they'd begun to fall apart. When Riley and I entered one of the domes, the first thing that I noticed was just how the structures manipulated the sound. Because of their shape, sound bounced really strangely inside. You could hear noises across the room like they were right next to you and could barely be able to hear the person right beside you. Also, it was the middle of the night in the desert. But there's no light pollution out there, so the only lights that we had were the moon, our phone flashlights, and Riley's dad's police-style flashlight. And the combination of the shadows and the sounds were very disorientating to say the least. So Riley and I were walking through these domes, chatting as she took photos until we caught up to the rest of the group. As we were walking, I could have sworn that I was hearing footsteps walking behind us on the dirt, and when we were rounding a corner, I looked back and I definitely saw a man tailing us. I saw this man multiple times throughout the night, in fact, and I would always ask Riley if she saw or heard anything too, but she always denied it and again told me that I was just being paranoid. The longer we stayed there, though, just the weirder things became. Others started hearing footsteps echoing outside, even if we were standing still. While we were in the center of the dome, we discovered a giant pentagram drawn on the floor with bones in the middle. I'm hoping that these were just someone's lunch leftovers from their edgy picnic or something, because I don't want to think that we were standing on the remnants of some satanic ritual. But while we were looking at the pentagram, we started hearing scratching on the walls. Not short and rapid scratches like an animal digging, but... Really long, slow scratches like something or someone was trying to make its presence known. At this point, Ryan and I were asking to leave because it was definitely getting to be a bit too freaky. But then, in the middle of us protesting, Cherry's face became expressionless and she slowly turned around and started walking towards the back of the room to what appeared to be either an exit or entrance of another room with a pony wall between us and it. As Cherry was walking in this trance-like state, Sarah was saying to her, don't go in there, Cherry, someone is following you, I'm telling you, don't go in there, you'll regret it, etc. But we all watched as she turned the corner and walked out of our view. 
It was probably only a few seconds, but it felt like we were waiting there for at least five minutes in anticipation. And then, we all heard Cherry let out a blood-curdling scream and run straight back to us. She started telling us how she needed to leave now and she didn't want to be there anymore. I thought for a moment that she was just pulling a prank on us, but the look of fear in her eyes and the trembling in her voice seemed just too genuine for that. Finally though, everyone agreed to start walking back to the car. When we were within visuals of the car, Sarah suddenly stopped and asked me to look at her back as she lifted her shirt up. And she had three long red scratch marks running down the length of her back. I said to her, holy crap, you have scratches, does it hurt? And Sarah was like, yeah, it burns. What, I have scratches? I started to reply to her when she interrupted me by screaming, run. You don't have to tell me twice. We all start running towards my car and as soon as I got in it, I started the car and asked if everyone was in and they frantically said yes, drive now. So I started to floor it when I heard one of them say, wait, Cherry's not here. I immediately stopped and backed up to find Cherry throwing a tantrum in the middle of the street. She yells at me, no it's cool, I'll stay here, and sits down in the middle of the street. I began to apologize and tell her to just get in the car, but she ignored me and just continued throwing a fit, yelling about how she wants to stay there and die and generally just being dramatic. I never did really like Cherry and while I did feel bad about almost leaving her there like that, her throwing a tantrum was really starting to piss me off and I was thinking about actually leaving her ass there for being a brat. But before I could, Sarah managed to convince her to get into the car and we began to drive off. We were about a quarter mile of the way when I saw a flashlight flickering on and off in the rearview mirror. I stopped and asked the rest of them if they saw that too. They said that they did and Sarah wanted me to turn around and see what it was. I refused and said that I wouldn't drive us back over there. And to that, Sarah replied with, Okay then, I'll drive. In my 16 year old brain I thought that that was a great idea and so we switched seats and she turned around. The lights appeared to be in the same location as the opening in the fence but as we passed we didn't see anything. We continued to drive about another quarter mile until we saw the flashing light in the rearview mirror again. So she turned around and again we didn't see anything when we passed. We repeated this two more times until I told her that I was fed up and that someone was probably just messing with us. And so we decided that we should just leave. But as we passed the entrance, she slammed the brakes and she rolled down a window. And in the shadow of the hedges, there was a man standing there just staring at us. The light from our phones were too dim to reach him and I was asking Riley to hand me her police flashlight but she was frozen in fear and I couldn't reach it. Sarah and Cherry were yelling at him, asking, hey, who are you? Were you the one with the flashlight? And then when he wouldn't answer, Cherry started to get aggressive with him. She started saying, hey, you freak, we're talking to you. What's your deal? And this next part still gives me shivers to this day. The man then took a step forward into the light so that we could see him. And in that moment, we all collectively realized what he was wearing. He had on a black cloak with a hood up and as he took another step forward, he raised his arms up to his side in a way that resembled Jesus Christ on the cross and in the most monotone but sinister voice said, don't worry guys, it's just me and smiled. As he said this, I was drawn to a reflection of light because he was holding a knife in his left hand. I immediately started yelling at Sarah to drive and he started sprinting towards the car. She floored it and as she did in the rearview mirror, we saw about 10 people run out of the hedges and the fence line towards our car. We were all looking back, screaming our heads off and when we turned onto the highway, we all eventually calmed down but after that, nobody spoke. When we reached the nearest gas station, Sarah asked to switch and I drove the rest of the way back to her house. Sarah and Cherry went to sleep upstairs in their bedroom. Cherry had actually been kicked out of her house and was temporarily living with Sarah and they shared a room and the bed in the room as well. Ryan and Riley and I slept on the big L-shaped couch downstairs in the living room and I was obviously still spooked but said a prayer and eventually I just fell asleep. 
And the next day, when I went home, everything was normal. About a week later, though, I got a text from Sarah to meet up. She had dropped out of school the previous semester to get a GED instead, and since I was in AP classes, it wasn't uncommon for me to not see her all week. That evening, she came over to my house, and she just looked awful. Her hair was greasy, her eyes looked tired and bloodshot, and I knew immediately that something was up. I brought her up to my room and asked her what was wrong, and she immediately started crying and told me about the past week. She said that night of the Dome's adventure, and every night since then, she's had this same nightmare. She's looking down at herself sleeping from the corner of the bedroom ceiling when this demon begins to crawl out of her closet. Apparently, it has the head of a ram, but the body of a man with no genitalia. It crawls toward her bed, and it moves as if every bone in its body is kind of broken. She's filled with absolute dread, as all she can do is watch. It climbs onto her bed and breathes heavily over her unconscious body, and at this point, she's so terrified that a single tear drops down onto the beast. The exact moment that the tear makes contact with this creature, its head turns 180 degrees, and it makes eye contact with her, and then she immediately wakes up from the dream and begins sobbing. It even got to the point where she was trying to pull an all-nighter, but always ended up passing out from exhaustion, and that morning she had begun to share her experiences with Cherry, when Cherry began to shake and cry as well. Sarah was confused, until Cherry said, I've been having that exact same dream every night too. After that, everything seemed to settle down, and we eventually lost contact, but I'll never forget that night at the Domes and everything that happened. This happened in my first year at uni, Australia. I was moving out of home for the first time, and I think this made me very, very naive in this situation, at 20 and female. So I found a cheap place in the city near my workplace or uni at the time, 150 bucks per week for a room in the storehouse, only 20 minutes out from the CBD. It seemed like an awesome deal to me and I messaged the landlord and told her that I was interested. Before she gave me time to come and inspect the place, she seemed overly interested in my ethnic background. I'm half Ethiopian so I definitely don't look white but when I told her that I'm Australian, she suddenly became kind of withdrawn. I thought it was strange, I mean maybe she thought that I was lying because she had seen my profile photo on flatmates.com, so I explained my background. She seemed satisfied with my answer and so we organized a time for me to come and see the room. So Denise showed me around and talked as if the place was already mine, which I thought was exciting. There was a main house with five bedrooms, a caravan on the side, and a granny flat behind it with three bedrooms, which is where I would be moving in. The main house and the caravan were full, seven people living there, but only one of the rooms in the granny flat was actually occupied. It was nice enough considering, and very clean. A weekly cleaner was included in the rent price, as well as weekly maintenance. I didn't think to ask what that meant because I was already pretty set at moving in, but I met the people who would go on to be my housemates. All of them were foreigners, mostly Chinese or South Korean, who had come to study. I still didn't find this odd. I mean, there are plenty of international students here. The door to my room had a lock on it, and I was told only myself and Denise had a key, but Denise never usually came to the house, so there was a nice level of privacy. So a week after I moved in, I met the maintenance guy, Patrick. He seemed to be gardening and came over to introduce himself. Seemed nice enough, and I found out that he's Denise's brother. He looked to be out in his late 40s or so, and I found him to be a, a little bit awkward, but... I've been raised to be polite to a fault, so I ended up talking to him for a long time before going back to my room. I don't remember what we talked about, but I remember he kept saying things like I was very beautiful and describing my skin as exotic and caramel more than once, which kind of rubbed me the wrong way if I'm being honest. A few days later, the cleaner comes also. She's super lovely and has known Denise and Patrick for a long time. She and I had nice chats and for some reason she brought up that Patrick was on the autism spectrum. So to me that explained his awkwardness and I realized that he's harmless so I felt bad about my initial judgment of him. The next time that I saw him I came out into the kitchen and saw him standing there. This struck me as odd because 
One, it was the morning and I was in my pajamas having just woken up. Two, he's the maintenance guy. I didn't understand why he should be inside. But I felt bad, so I just smiled and I said g'day. He turned and seemed startled, but explained to me that he was just taking out the trash. I saw that he had actually replaced the bins in the kitchen, so I was just like, oh, okay, he was just trying to be nice, I guess. But I told him that he really didn't have to do that. He just kind of insisted, though, and I was like, meh, all right, whatever. I ended up talking to him again, and again, he seemed to have a weird fixation with me being exotic, even though I told him that I was born in Australia. But mostly he was just generally asking how I was finding the place, and he reiterated that everything was super safe, and for some reason brought up the keys to the bedrooms. He said only me, Denise, and he had keys. I didn't say anything out loud, but in my head I thought, wait, since when does he have a key? But in the end, I still just kind of brushed it off. We cut to a few months later. I work about four to six days a week, casual, as well as going to uni four days, so I'm rarely there during the day, and I lock my bedroom door before leaving every day. I don't remember exactly what time of the year this would have been, but it was colder and I hadn't used the ceiling fan in my room for a while. I got home, unlocked my bedroom door, and I noticed that the ceiling fan was on. This struck me as odd immediately because I knew that I hadn't turned it on in like forever. I was very, very confused and thought that I'd turned it on while leaving or something and just didn't remember maybe... I brought it up with my roommate and she just kind of shrugged it off and said, that's odd, but didn't seem weirded out by it. So I figured that I was just overthinking it. But note too that I kept to myself a lot, wasn't close to any of my roommates and only talked to this woman occasionally. So a few weeks later, I'm leaving for work and I have a very strange feeling while walking to the front gate of the house. For some reason, I turn around and I see Patrick hiding behind some bushes, staring at me. As soon as he's caught, he turns and pretends to be gardening. In the moment, my mind actually went kind of blank. I was like, surely he wasn't just watching me, right? All I did was frown and kind of wonder to myself why he would stare at me like that and then pretend that he hadn't been. I come back later in the day, though, unlock my door, walk in, and again, something is just off but this time I can't put my finger on it. I stand in my room looking around, staring at everything in the room, but I can't find anything when I realize that I don't know what I'm looking for and I feel creeped out and I just leave the room and tell my roommate again that I thought someone had been in my room. But this time, she sat down with me and basically said that she thought someone went into her room recently too. We chatted and she said that she left her bedroom window open when she went to work and when she came home, it was shut. I brought up the fan again and my roommate said that maybe we should let Denise know. So I texted Denise and said something along the lines of, I think someone's going into my room because of X and Y events and my roommate said the same thing. I exchanged a few messages with Denise but the general response from her was just, oh wow, that's so bizarre. Again, being super naive and young and way too polite for my own good, I assumed that I was just overreacting and didn't want to seem like a bad tenant. Thankfully, it turns out Denise was more sympathetic than I realized because she said that she was going to have the locks changed the next day. I was like, great, thanks, and assumed that that would be it. But in my head I was thinking, only three people have the keys, me, Denise, and Patrick. So, if someone had been coming in, wouldn't it have had to have been one of the three of us? Which is why I didn't feel good when Patrick showed up the next day to change the lock himself, being the maintenance guy and all. I ended up leaving while he did the change, got a text later saying that it was done and new keys were in the mailbox. Fast forward now, and I'd now been at this place for nearly a year... By now I was aware that Patrick seemed to come over about twice a week and he always came inside the house to take out the rubbish but never seemed to really do maintenance work. I chalked it up to Denise giving him a job because maybe he couldn't find one elsewhere and I tried to avoid him. As far as I remember, nothing else seemed strange until now and I came home from work again and walked in to my bedroom. While I'm getting my clothes to shower, 
I noticed something very, very strange that was definitely not there when I left. And there was some whitish pale gunk kind of splattered upwards on the wall and the floor. Honestly, my first thought when looking at it after a while was like, that looks like donut glaze or something. I leaned closer to it, but still didn't really register what the stuff was, only that I definitely didn't spill anything at all in here. So, again, I got creeped, went to the kitchen, grabbed the chucks, and wiped it up. When I had the thought like, wait, is that... I really didn't know what to look for, but as soon as I had that thought, nothing could convince me otherwise, and again, my door had been locked. Only myself, Denise, and Patrick had keys. My roommate wasn't home, but I called Denise right away. She didn't answer, so instead I messaged her and said basically someone had been in my room and there was some weird stuff splattered on the wall. I wanted to see if she came to the same conclusion that I did, but her response this time was really off. She messaged me back hours later and was dismissive, said something like, yeah, very bizarre, the lock has been changed though, and I was like, yeah, obviously, so who do you think would have been in there? I felt so weird and kind of grossed out that I went to a friend's place and messaged my stepdad about it. I told him everything for the first time too, and I guess that it sounds a lot worse all at once because his response was, hell no, you're moving out of there. I called Denise and I told her that I was moving out if the issue wasn't taken seriously. And this is when I realized that the leasing situation at this place was really dodgy, which I didn't know beforehand due to lack of experience and no sense to ask. But essentially, there was no record of me actually being a tenant, and I was just kind of sending money into this lady's bank account, but there wasn't any official paperwork. I looked back over the stuff that I'd signed when I initially moved in, and it was actually typed up by Denise, I assume. I don't remember details, but it wasn't official at all, and again, super naive and young. So, I was able to move out ASAP. Denise didn't put up a fuss about the short notice, and when I came back the next day, the stuff on the wall was gone, so I didn't have any proof of what actually happened. But... That at least just kind of confirmed to me that something weird was going on with Denise and Patrick. My stepdad helped me take all my stuff out. I didn't have much. Denise just left a message and said, please leave the keys on the counter. And it took me a few weeks to process every creepy thing that happened throughout my stay there and put it all together as a, a kind of a massive creep fest. My roommate left soon after that as well. And months later, she actually messaged me to say that but one of the old housemates told her that the police were called to the place and they don't know why or what happened, but I suspect that it wasn't for the tenants. This happened to me over a decade ago, but I'll never forget the feeling deep in my chest, both that night and the next morning when the true nature of the situation became apparent. It was late December in a small Texas town. We had just received five inches of snow earlier in the day. I can't remember what time it was, and all I remember was it was dark out. I was playing in my room though, and it's important to note that my room was made up of two rooms. My mudroom with a door leading out to the front, then my actual bedroom. The door was an old style wood door with all the old hardware and had a window on the top half. It had a window shade, but that wouldn't stop anyone from looking in if they wanted. My room was the frontmost with my parents' room being in the back of the house as well. So I was in my mudroom playing with my Hot Wheels when I felt something weird, like someone was watching me. I was trying to focus on the little openings left by the window shade. I stared, looking for any reason to feel unsafe and run, but after a while I was sure that there was nothing, so I went back to playing. A few minutes later, I got that feeling again though. And this time, I didn't look at the door, but instead moved to where my back was now at the door, and I was just hoping that it was all in my head. Just then, the most terrifying thing happened. There was a noise at the door, like the doorknob was being touched. I was still turned around, back facing the door. I was completely frozen at the metal-on-metal -metal sound of the doorknob. It was definitely moving. I didn't know how or why, but it was moving, slowly turning, testing the lock. I wanted to move, but I was frozen. 
It was honestly like someone just glued every joint in my body. My chest felt like a car was parked on it. My parents had been in the shower all the way at the back of the house, leaving me at the front all alone, with the only room lit up being mine. Suddenly, the doorknob was not being gently moved, and someone was turning it with force now. This door was one that had been locked with a skeleton key, so the knob could turn and open freely. But luckily, there were two deadbolts, and whoever was on the other side just figured out that the knob was free to open. As soon as I heard the knob turn all the way, I sprung up to the wall about five feet from the door, my back to the wall. The door fell silent, and I found myself glued on the wall, unable to move. Then the knob turned slowly, and I remember watching, just waiting for it to turn all the way. And when it did, whoever was on the other side started to try and budge the door and pry it open, and at first it was easy going, but then they started pounding into the door with their foot, and they got only two kicks in when I unfroze and screamed for my life. I sprinted to the back of the house to get my parents. They asked what was wrong, and I told them that someone was trying to break in. They immediately ran and checked, not bothering to look outside, which I pleaded them to go and check outside, and they just said that my imagination was running wild and it must have been an animal or the old age of the house. They took one final look in my mudroom, not bothering to investigate any further, and then I was just told to go to bed. It took me hours, and I don't even remember falling asleep. All I remember is staring at the door from my bed, never taking my eyes off the door. Suddenly, though, I was woken up by my parents, who were obviously distressed and seemed to be scared. My mom grabbed me by both shoulders and got right in front of me. She asked very sternly why I thought someone tried to break in. When I told them this time, they actually seemed to listen. I was really worried how serious they were as they asked me about everything. But when I was done, they said that they have to go show me something, and they took me to the front door and out to the front yard, and pointed to my door near the driveway. And when I looked, you could clearly see boot prints in the snow, walking along the street through our yard and straight to my window, then my mudroom door, where I'd been playing the night prior. The police showed up and took a report, but nothing ever really came from it, and I was never able to sleep well in that house again. I can never forget what it felt like as a child to go through this, and to not have my parents believe me like that. I'm just glad that I wasn't home alone, and very thankful for those dead bullets. Just down the road from where a few years ago I had previously lived, in southeast Australia, is the opening into about a hundred acres of woodland and bush that I frequently went into when I was younger to do the usual things like riding and camping. Now, I was out driving it around 11.30pm with my girlfriend and as we were in the area, decided to show her the woodlands while we were in the area, as she loves everything to do with nature and it was summer so an extremely warm night. I left my car with the light shining into the trees as we weren't going too far in and it was pitch black inside and the two of us just kind of sat chatting anyway, having a smoke and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put into some plastic and I was keeping an eye on the trees as, for some reason, I had a feeling that something was just not quite right. I've heard a few people say that they felt that they were in danger, although nothing around them was off, and it was kind of like that feeling. Every sense was almost reaching out and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eyeline that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different to before. It was only after staring in the dark that I saw that there was moonlight now lighting up the grass where it couldn't before as there was a, a black shape blocking it that before I thought was a tree. Now, the only way I can describe the next part is that all the sound just kind of ceased and everything, and I mean literally everything, went dead silent. And a few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread just fell over me and I saw motion in the dark of the path as this thing crawled toward us on more fours. Now, I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here and I can assure you that we don't have any large predators like in the US or Europe, but somehow 
I knew that this thing was a predator and it wasn't hiding itself from us, but was just kind of slowly crawling towards us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line where my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat there staring at us. So I'm 6'4", but this thing was about another meter larger than me at least, with arms that were just far too long that reached down near the ground, and all I could make out was a sort of off-white, almost yellowish fur on it, and in the dim light, could make out the silhouette of its head as like a dog or a wolf maybe. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but... It was at this point that my girlfriend gasped, which seemed to break whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. I grabbed her by the arm and we sprinted to my car, slammed the doors and tore out of there as fast as I could, both of us too scared to speak until about a half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a, a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or a fox looking at it. That this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it chose to. Neither of us have been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it's definitely changed the way that I view the woods and the bush here. And when I go camping or hiking now, I think back to that and wonder what it was. And if I'll ever see anything like it again. I was in a lonely and quite vulnerable time within my life back then. I was looking for a good time and just wanted to be with someone. I was a bit shaken up for maybe a week after it happened, but I eventually got over it and I moved on with my life. So there was this young and really attractive dude, or so I thought, whose profile I came across. I was about 20 at the time. We spoke and we exchanged pics and messages. We planned to meet up, and he gave me his address, and later in the day, I took an Uber to that address. I was standing around for hours. It was really dark and was getting late in the night. I had previously knocked on the door of the address, and then resorted to standing around near the address to see if I'd get a message or response or anything, but I didn't get anything. I sent him so many messages with no responses, and quite honestly, I was really disappointed, but... I didn't give him trouble about it. I was more so disappointed about the wasted Uber money than I was with him because it wasn't exactly the cheapest ride there and back. The next day though, on the dating app that I was using, he sent me stories about something happening with someone in his family. I don't exactly remember it, but thinking back, I can't believe I actually believed him when he told me. I felt just so stupid. But that same day as we were talking, all was forgiven and we just chalk it up to sometimes bad stuff happens and we planned to meet up again at a much earlier time this time. So I came to the same address and as I'm knocking on the door, I don't get a response and I look around. But this time I see an old man sitting in a black car across the street from the house and he's just kind of staring at me. The creepy thing though was that he was staring as if I was candy or something that he just couldn't resist and he just had to have me. I waited around a bit longer. The old man is still there just staring at me and I get a little bit uncomfortable and kind of worried too. And that was when it hit me. He was that young and really attractive dude that I'd been talking to this entire time. I didn't know what to do upon the realization, but I wasn't going to confront him or anything. I just remember being really angry, followed by sadness, and I got an Uber to go back. I blocked him on the app after sending him a nasty message. I don't know if he saw it or not before I blocked him, but I didn't care. But he didn't stop there, because he followed the Uber that I was in. I kept a watchful eye out for his car, and I was pretty damn terrified, but was relieved that he ended up losing us on the highway. I never did see him again after that, but I'll never forget the disgusting and snarky look that he had on his face as he was kind of staring at me, just seemingly so proud of what he did. I couldn't think straight for a solid week after that. The wasted money, the emotional trauma, and just the, the pure anger. I learned an important lesson about being safer in dating apps after that and teaching myself that sometimes we're just vulnerable and we shouldn't get so caught up in that.
This happened in the summer of 2010 when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip in the first place, but I remember a lot of family members coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents, and it's not really important to the story, but to preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat, and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This, however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I think I'm incredibly lucky that I trusted my instincts. So this hotel had a... A uh, really strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor and not the bottom floor, which I found strange. Uh, to access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs, and uh, this information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and the cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they just stepped out of their room and looked around. I always was afraid that I'd fall over this balcony and sail down eight stories to my death, but they were high enough to a point where I wasn't too concerned for my safety or anything. So the first day or two was nice. My friends and I just hung out and played cards all day, or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. All in all, it was actually a really fun time, even though I didn't fully understand why we were there. But on the third day, things just got pretty strange quickly. So I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside of my door. Now, because of the hotel's design that I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So when I walked outside to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. And I saw a girl laying on the ground, eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her and I heard a couple of people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious maybe, or maybe she'd passed out or something. I couldn't quite tell, but I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all staring at the event in front of them. I decided that I'd rush down to meet them to find out what had happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of the floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or the 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about eh, four flights down, I think. Not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall, or the letter L, I passed floor 5, ready to find a door to the lobby, and I took about two more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the fourth floor, nor had there been a door for the third or the second. Now at this point, I probably should have turned back, but I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into the pitch black areas that a bunch of piping and wiring were at, and though I was curious to explore, I just kind of passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby, so I opened them and entered. Behind the door, though, was a a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a, a small basketball stadium. The only light that came in was from the stairwell behind me, so I really wasn't able to see too much, but the stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap, tables lined the wall, and in the distance I thought that I could see boxes stacked, and lined against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room for the hotel, I reasoned. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of the room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk in the dim light. But the room was super muggy and dusty and it seemed like nobody had been down there in a really long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed that it was a little bigger than the elevators in the lobby and the other floors. I pressed the up button but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the bottom. It must have been for the employees only, I thought. I turned back towards the stairwell doors, making my way past the chairs and the tables along the wall when I got to the door and I gave it a tug. And it was locked, of course. 
But this is when things started to really hit me. I realized that I was stuck in the dark and dusty basement of a hotel. I didn't have a phone because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone. Everyone likely assumed that I was still asleep in the room, so I began to freak out believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse looking for other ways out. Some of the areas were better lit than others, so I looked around in those areas that I could see first before starting in the darker side of the rooms. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. And it was at this stage that I began to cry and I was scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear too that it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed before. I heard the door creak open and it wasn't the door from the stairwell though. Rather, it was the second door that I'd found. And a slim middle-aged man in a lab coat came out of the doors. Now... If this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would have been very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time though, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. So I approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked surprised to see me, as you'd expect. Hey, what are you doing down here? He yelled. Uh... I got lost on my way down to the lobby and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of there. He didn't answer my question and instead he said, I know a way out of here. Follow me. He began to walk me towards the doors with the stairwell and I followed, relieved that somebody had finally come to save me. We approached the doors and I began to reach for the handle but he continued walking Hey, uh, isn't it right here? I asked him. I'll never forget the look on his face when I said that too, because he looked nervous. And though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. He had passed the door to the stairs, and we were now headed toward a, a darker side of the basement, away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me to, as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner, though, and began walking towards the boxes. And it was a dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. So I said, my voice shaking, Okay, uh, where are we going? He turned and then said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by these boxes. I had checked there first after I found out the stairwell door was locked. And I want to thank whatever god is up there for gifting me with the idea that I had next. I started yelling as loud as I could. I yelled so loud, in fact, that I gave myself a headache after this, and the man, irritated, plugging his ears, began yelling back at me, What are you doing? Be quiet. I continued to yell, though, and I don't even remember how long I was yelling for, but finally, the man snapped and began to quickly walk towards me. I went in a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God that they'd somehow be magically open. He didn't run after me, he walked sternly behind me, muttering things like stupid fucker and many other kind compliments. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through. My saviour, a hotel janitor who just so happened to hear the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation, me and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement, and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was and I said that I had no idea that he had come in through the door on the other side of the room and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he had found a child in the basement and quietly so that I wouldn't hear, he said, this man came from outside, get security or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he simply was looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it though and kept saying things like, Uh, yeah, wait till security gets here and you can talk to them about it. 
I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, confused out of my mind. Eventually, though, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby where I met with my family, who surprisingly had no idea that I was even missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over for their help. I never did get to thank that janitor, though, which is a bit of a shame. Looking back now, though, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing in that basement. I don't have any information as to what happened afterwards or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated, something about low blood sugar, I'm not sure, but I've thought about that day a lot and the only explanation that I can put together is that the door that I'd found in the basement led to the streets of the city where he must have wandered in from or something. I have no clue what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat of all things, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out like he did. To be frank, I suppose this could have just been a, a huge misunderstanding of some sort, and I just chose a really bad time to get lost, but all I know for sure is that if I hadn't have screamed my lungs out like I did, I may not have been telling the story the same way, or even at all. Working as a second grade teacher, it's not unusual to hear some bizarre stuff, but after a while you just pretty much learn to go with it. But throughout my career, there was really only one student though that made me rethink teaching at one point. I won't use his real name for privacy reasons obviously, so I'll just call him Billy. So Billy was just your average second grader, I never really had problems with him. Maybe he'd get up and wander around or shout out in class sometimes, but tons of students had little issues here and there like that. But then one day, I noticed that he was acting a little different than usual. It was raining pretty heavy that day, and I recall it being pretty dark and gloomy. I had the class pair up in groups for a project, and that's when I saw Billy was still sitting at his table just drawing on some paper. I knew that he had friends in class, so it couldn't be that he didn't have anybody to work with. So I stopped by his desk and told him that it was time to participate in our group project. And without even looking at me, he just said, no thanks, I'm supposed to finish my drawing. I watched him draw for a moment, but honestly it didn't look like he was really creating anything. Just coloured shapes and random doodling, so I told him that this wasn't part of any assignment today and he could finish it during his free time. But then he looked at me and said, well, my teacher said that I have to finish it right now. I was taken aback a bit, not entirely sure what he was talking about. I looked around the class. All the other students were still pairing up, so I sat next to Billy and gently told him that I was his teacher, but I never said that he had to finish this drawing or anything. And almost instantly, he replied back, saying that I wasn't his teacher anymore, that Mr. Shadow was. Now... As a teacher, I could have went along with this story, but I didn't want him to think that this idea was okay, especially in class. So I told him that there was no Mr. Shadow at this school. And then Billy looked at me in a way that I've never seen him look, almost as if he was scared and angry at the same time. Then he softly whispered to me, Mr. Shadow is real. The way he said it, he made it seem so real. Still looking at him, I asked him where Mr. Shadow was. He sunk down in his chair and his eyes moved towards the floor. And then he whispered out that he was standing behind you. In that moment, I honestly felt the hairs on the back of my neck raise up. But nothing could prepare me for what happened next. As I stood up from Billy's desk, I started to tell him that I didn't see a Mr. Shadow. Then Billy quickly covered his eyes with his hands... That's when I noticed that the rest of the classroom was extremely quiet. So I turned around to face them. And all the other students were backed up against the chalkboard. And they all looked terrified as if they'd just seen a ghost. To this day, it's been the most unexplainable thing that I've ever seen. One night, maybe almost a year ago now, I was waiting for my boyfriend outside of the liquor store. 
I was waiting in the car and it was pretty much dark outside. This girl comes up to the car and I hear her say, Angela. It caught me off guard as I couldn't really see her so I don't know how she recognized me. But anyway, I opened the door slightly because well, I thought maybe she was somebody that I knew. But when I did, I didn't recognize her at all. She made casual conversation with me, small talk, seemed fairly normal. I was very confused, obviously, but thought maybe it was someone that I'd met at a party that I just didn't remember. About a week later, I got a bunch of weird messages on Instagram, though. They made no sense whatsoever. She sounded either tweaked out or uh, like a paranoid schizophrenic or something. I went to the profile and looked at the pics, and it was that same girl. She was typing nonsense, and I mean literal nonsense, paranoid delusional thoughts that made no sense whatsoever. So I brushed it off, because whatever, right? But I'll admit that I was still weirded out. Anyway, a few months later, I see her in line at my work. I have no idea how she knew where I worked. I mean, I work at a restaurant similar to Chipotle, and I was at the start of where people order and whatnot. And when she got to the front of the line, she said, Hey, what time are you off? And I said, later, and didn't give her an exact time, obviously. She said okay to this, and then just walked away. Didn't order anything or say anything else, so I knew then that she was there to see me. But once again, though, I really don't know how she knew that I worked there, because, I mean, I don't put my work on social media or anything. After this encounter though, I went on my break to check my phone and I received an Instagram message from her. She was saying things like, I was going to beat your ass and all of this threatening delusional stuff. I told my manager and he said that he would walk me to my Uber at the end of the night, which he did. After this, I blocked the Instagram account, didn't hear from her for a while at least. Until a few months ago when I saw in a police report from my city that she been arrested for attempted murder. She had attempted to push two high school cross-country runners over a bridge. It's a bridge very close to my house that I often cross while walking home from work and it really freaked me out. Since she had a slight obsession with me, I thought, wow, what if that had been me walking that bridge since I take that route so much? Luckily, the kids fought her off and she was arrested and booked on attempted murder. I don't know how long she's going to be in for. This is California, and I don't know how much sentencing when it comes to stuff like that is, but anyway, she's in jail for now, and I sure hope that I don't see her in the future again. So, I've never really told anyone this story, because, well, I don't think anyone's going to believe me. To be honest, too, I don't even know if I believe myself. I was about 11 or 12, 2002, and I came home from school at 2.30 and stayed alone until my parents got home from work a few hours later. My dad around 4.30 and my mum about 6. On this particular afternoon, I came into the garage, walked around the corner to the foyer where our stairs were to go up to my room. In the foyer, we had this sort of cabinet thing that was really old and had a little shelf on the front of it. As I pass it, I notice a pair of gloves sitting on the shelf. Very heavy fur gloves that you'd imagine someone wearing in the winter in the 1800s or something. Like gloves out of the Revenant. I'd never seen them before, obviously, in my life, and it was also summertime, so it just made no sense that they would be there. But then, all of a sudden, I heard a distinct deep cough upstairs. I was paralyzed with fear at this point. I have no idea why I didn't run as I just quietly sat and listened at the kitchen table, but I could hear footsteps of someone quite heavily walking around above me, and these weren't just sounds of the house settling. This definitely was someone walking around up there. Anyway, my logic at the time was that it was an intruder, and if I didn't put up a fight, they would just leave without hurting me once they came down and got their weird gloves. But I sat there for quite some time and no one ever came down. After what seemed like days, my dad gets home from work and I immediately tell him everything and to come look at the gloves and check upstairs. And to my disbelief, the gloves are just gone. 
My dad checks everywhere upstairs and there's nothing missing. No sign of anyone there and no sign of forced entry anywhere. And my dad has always been extremely thorough about home security, so there's no way that there was an unlocked door or window. Basically, he thought that I was just making stuff up and after that, I just never mentioned it again. I've not had any other experiences like that ever since then and I generally believe that most everything can be explained. The only thing I can think of for this though was that it was a, a dream but I'm 99% sure that it wasn't and when I asked my dad recently he said that he remembers coming home to me freaking out about some gloves and a man upstairs so it definitely happened. So I was working at this hospital called Warren General in Warren, PA, about 90 minutes east of Erie, PA. I work night shift. I'm a travel RN, so this was one of those hospitals that I traveled to. But one night, my floor was slow, so I pulled down to the CCU to work. And well, that night, my patient rang her call bell at 3 o'clock in the morning, and she asked me, well, what does she want? I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, the nurse that keeps coming in here and standing there in that corner. And she points to the corner behind the door. So uh, I was like, who? Ashley? The nurse that I was working with. And I pointed to her. She was sitting at the nurse's station on the computer. And she says, no, the other one. Well, there was no other one. And it was just us two. Just FYI too, the patient was a, a woman in her 50s and didn't have history of mental illness and was not taking any meds that would make her hallucinate or anything. So, in the end, I just kind of laughed it off and I was just like, it's just us. And she just stares at me, so I say, okay, uh, if she does it again, just yell for me, alright, and I'll come right in. Her room was about 8 feet in front of the nurse station, so it wasn't far to get to. About a half hour goes by though, and she yells, See, there you go again. I got up, started walking, and I hear the bathroom door shut. It had definitely been cracked open just a little bit to give her dark room a little bit of light, and I walked in and I say, See, you're dreaming. There's nobody else here. She says, No, she went into the bathroom. So I open the door, and the light's still on, but there's nobody in there. Looking confused, I say, uh, what does she look like? Because I thought someone was just messing around. It's too dark to tell. I can tell it's a woman, but she's so dark that I can't really make her face out. And when she says that, I get a little weirded out, I'll admit. But the night ends, and eventually I forget about it. Three months go by and I get pulled back down to the same unit at some stage. I have the same room as before and this time a man in his early 60s is the patient. Nice guy, alert and oriented and very polite. Night's going good, it's about 3am and his call light goes off, which means that he needs something. So I walk in and he says to me, uh, excuse me, you're my nurse right? I shake my head yes and then he says, Well, why does that lady keep coming in here and standing in the corner? What is she doing? I almost crapped myself instantly. This was three months later, same room and same thing. I said to him, Ah, uh, honestly, sir, I think it's a ghost. And he just laughs and I say, You're not the first one to say that. After this, I started telling everyone about it, and then I found out that the entire second floor has a nurse that's seen every once in a while. I heard that in the 1990s, a nurse who worked up there apparently shot herself in the second floor bathroom, because, allegedly, she was stressed out and had some problems. So... It's been about uh, a year since my last story, I suppose, and I visit this place every now and then to listen to other people's stories, but I haven't had much interest in contributing any of my own. But the stories that I have shared were mainly for entertainment, 
What I mean is that I could recount the events with ease because they virtually meant nothing to me. Just interesting stories to tell, you know. However, what I'm about to share is not something many of my closest friends or even family know about. The events that happened to me were, well, traumatic. The effects have cemented in the way that I think, view people, and my ability to trust or lack thereof. I'm uh, afraid to admit that this is not a story in which I showed immense courage or resilience or anything. Instead, I just kind of buried these memories deep until more recently. This is a pretty messed up encounter story that is about a truly sick man. The kind you hear about on TV or podcasts or something. The kind of evil man who managed to build something of himself despite his unnatural desires, only to use his wealth and resources to further manipulate and take advantage of kids. So, a little bit of background. I grew up in a very poor part of New England, a Hispanic dominated area. The city is pretty small and has always been a conundrum to me really. But the city is known for its drugs use and violence. It was once a, a prospering mill city, one where immigrants came to work and secure their own slice of the American dream. The city and much of its residents have since disintegrated like the stones that make up the massive factories that loom over the city. The conundrum I speak of is while this city remains open to high criminal activity, the surrounding towns are just doing great. Less than 10 miles north you enter New Hampshire where things are generally quiet and south you'll pass through multiple rich and thriving towns. And the man that I'll introduce later would come down from New Hampshire to prey on the poor kids from my community. So, uh, I was maybe uh, 13 years old, I think. It was definitely summertime because I remember the heat. It was a fun summer, though. My friends and I were outside all the time, and while none of us had a car, we made the most of walking where we needed to go, and I was a bit younger than the guys that I was hanging out with at the time, so they were always able to kind of stay out later than me. It's funny how everything that happens while you're not there feels like you've missed out on the best stuff. Anyway... One day, while we are all just kind of hanging around, a friend of mine mentions, Hey, uh, maybe we can get Ryan to come by and buy us some food. Always feeling left out, I acted as if I knew who Ryan was, the whole time thinking that he was a teenager, perhaps in his early 20s, I suppose. I let the conversation go on for a bit before I could not resist, and I asked, Who's Ryan? The response I got drove me crazy because it only furthered my frustration of not totally feeling like I was a part of the game. You don't know who Ryan is? We've been working for him for a few weeks now. He owns a junkyard and we go and strip cars, log spare parts and just mess around really. We get him to buy us stuff and he lets us drive his cars. I thought, how could this be? I felt so embarrassed and betrayed that all my friends apparently had a job. And we're going out to eat and drive cars and I was just finding out about it. So, wanting to fit in, I urged them to get me a job too. But my friend Eli, a leading figure in our group, pulls out his cell phone and gives this Ryan guy a call. But the way Eli was talking to him made it seem like Eli was in control. Like he was bullying Ryan or something. He spoke to him aggressively and told him that we were hungry and for him to come and pick us up and buy us some food. And Ryan agreed. Shortly after this, the man pulls up in his red pickup with a toe in the back and his company logo on the side of the truck. He was a white man, mid-40s, short and kind of chubby. He had a high-pitched voice that screeched out when he would laugh. And when he arrived, he immediately turned to Eli and started talking shit to him, making fun of him, letting out a bit of a laugh. It weirdly made me feel at ease too, because it just wasn't the way I expected an adult to act. It was kind of like he was one of us and you were in if you were cool with him. Eli introduced me to him and told him that I want to work. He examined me and asked if I knew anything about cars. I told him that I did and he agreed that we'd talk about it over lunch. He told us all to jump into his truck and asked me to sit in the front seat so that we could talk. I remember that drive like it was yesterday. We were listening to the radio and I could see that it was singing underneath his breath so I purposely started singing the song out loud, acting as if I didn't know that he was also singing. He noticed and turned the music up, looked at me and started singing loudly. 
We did this the whole ride until arriving at an Italian place, and the food was amazing. I had only ever been out to eat a handful of times at this stage and none of them were with friends, ordering whatever we wanted and goofing off the whole time. It was a real treat and only really made me want to be in with Ryan even more. It was clear that he played favourites and those who he liked received more gifts. And at the end of lunch, he agreed to give me a job and made Eli agree to let me know the next time that we had to work. The next month or so felt like I was having the best summer of my life. Ryan owned a junkyard in New Hampshire and also had a car rental service. He was expanding his business, so there was a ton of construction going on. His office was in a construction trailer outside the yard. This is where you would find him if you needed anything. He would pick us up in the morning and bring us to the yard, and for eight hours, we would honestly just kind of mess around. We'd walk to the very end of the yard and hide out in cars. We would take naps and scavenge through the hundreds of cars hoping to find valuables and occasionally we would actually have to work but even then we would mess around a lot and all the while we were getting paid. Not a ton in retrospect but more than any of us had ever received. But more than the pay, what we really wanted was our own car. He easily had 30 of them, not including the cars that he rented. Each car was in fair shape and each day he would throw Eli a different set of keys and it really made the rest of us jealous. You see, Ryan didn't really care if you had a license or not and Eli did it and he drove a different car pretty much every day. I personally had my eye on a Mazda sedan. I wanted the car so bad when I approached Ryan that I nearly begged him for it. He agreed that we would talk about it at the end of the day and I spent the whole day just kind of imagining my life with that car. How cool I would look, pulling up to places, getting girls attention and a car at the time was like entering a new world and I just might have one at the end of the day. The end of the day came and he threw Eli some keys and told him to bring everyone home except for me. This wasn't alarming to anyone because all I could think about the whole day was how he was going to give me that car. After everyone left and the sun was setting, Ryan asked me to talk in his trailer. He started with how kids are always coming and going, trying to take advantage of him, stealing from him and explaining how ungrateful people are to his generosity. And I strangely felt like he was speaking about me, but kind of indirectly. He asked me a lot of questions about drug use are you on drugs? Have you ever taken any? How do I know that I can trust you? How do I know if you'll pay me back and just not ruin my car and never give me a dime? My response to all of it was no. I would thoroughly work off what I owed for the car. And he then asked if I had anything in my pockets. I said no and willingly turned them out. And then he said, Do you really think that I'm that stupid? Like you would hide stuff in your pockets? I know that you're hiding things in your clothes. I had no warning bells ringing because a lot of what he was saying was true. We all stole from him, whatever we could, whenever we could get away with it. We all thought that we were in control and kind of using it. It's a, an amazing thing how someone can get you to do something and to do it on your own accord. I feel like it was your idea. No matter what I said though, he just kept repeating, I know you have something, I know you do. Ensuring him that I don't, I would move my shirt around and pull on my waistband. It wasn't taking, he just kept repeating that he doesn't make deals with thieves. And then I got the idea, painfully in retrospect, that I'll just take my stuff off, show this guy that I don't have anything. So, standing there with most of my stuff off at this point, I took off my pants and I stood there in triumph thinking, huh, you see, I don't have anything. With only my boxes on, I started to kind of jokingly dance because I thought that I had won. I don't have anything after all. But then, Ryan said, take off your boxes. I was really confused by this and I was like, what? I don't have anything. Why does this guy not believe me? Ryan just sat behind his desk and told me again to take my boxes off and I was frozen. And even though I hadn't said the words... I knew that I was alone at this point, far away from home, and confusion just took over my mind. I didn't have any thoughts really, just kind of frozen, and 
he leaned forward and said, are you going to make me go over there and take them off for you? It's weird how I still did not think that I was being taken advantage of. Honestly, my brain still thought that this guy really thinks that I stole something. And I actually remember thinking to myself, what the fuck could I hide in my boxes? I said to him again that I don't have anything and, well, he completely dropped the whole stealing bit. And then just said straight out, I want to see your dick. Pull it out. At this point, I didn't know what to do. It really sucks that you don't have any options to freeze time, actually think about what's happening, and instead, you're forced to make a choice, as fast as you can choose the words while having a conversation. My brain went into survival mode though, and that mode was to not look at the situation for what it actually was. I did what he asked, choosing to believe that it wasn't a big deal. He just sat there and looked at me, and honestly, thank god that that's all that he did. I began to shake and I grabbed my clothes and he snapped out of whatever world that he was in and started moving things around on his desk, looking in drawers and I couldn't meet his eyes because I was ashamed and confused. He eventually spoke and said something like, don't crash it as he threw the keys to the Mazda. I caught the keys and left, trying really hard not to think about what had just happened. I didn't want to face it and that's why when I got home... I just chose not to say anything. My father, who I am sure would have killed him, I was embarrassed to tell him. Knowing he would think, why would you do that? Why didn't you fight? I raised you to be tough. Why would you do that? And so in the end, I just showed up like any other night, except this time, I had my own car. Now, I clearly did not think things through because I was like 14 and I just came home with a car. My parents were pissed and they told me to call one of my friends and have them pick the car up and they also said that I couldn't work there anymore. To be honest though, I wasn't upset. The next day, I told Eli that I was quitting and asked if he could pick up my last pay. He tried to convince me not to quit but I stuck to my parents being adamant on my quitting and Eli would call me a few days later and tell me that Ryan wouldn't give me what he owed me. Instead, I had to get it myself. I never tried to get the money because I just couldn't face it. Fast forward a few months though and I was with some of those guys and my friend Joe said something. Hey uh, guys did Ryan ever ask you to show him your dick? And to my surprise, everyone said yes. But they all said that they didn't do it. I lied to them all and made up some story where I freaked out and threatened him. And over the years, I found out that all of the kids did it. There were eight of us. One kid did it with his mum waiting outside in a car to pick him up, in fact. Not sure if Ryan knew that she was outside, but the kid just never said anything. We all just kind of buried it. But we were tough guys, or wanted to be. And no one wanted to remember that. Fast forward again seven or eight years this time and I was 22 or 23 and a newer friend who was struggling to get work tells me that he landed a job at a junkyard in New Hampshire, except the guy who owns it asked him to get naked and show him his dick. And my mind nearly blew up. By then, I had grappled a bit with it and developed anger and I freaked out asked him to tell me everything and he said that he's known to pick people up for work and after a couple of days of working he invited my friend joe into his trailer and basically did something that he did to me what actually really disappointed me though was that my friend who was in his 20s actually did it and even now i understand the craziness of the request and how he's able to get you to do it but i so badly wish that joe acted the way that i wish i did knocking this guy's teeth down his throat. What's even crazier though is that while he was telling me, this girlfriend that we both had overheard and says, are you guys talking about creepy Ryan? And again, my mind just blows up. She tells us that he's apparently gotten multiple people over the years and he can't be touched, that people have tried but he does tow work for the city and PD of that town and has since made connections. Now, I don't know the details of these reports, whether or not investigations were underway, but people told the truth and he was still out there doing what he wanted. 
and while hearing that he was still out there was truly shocking, my thoughts on him ended with that drunk conversation. Fast forward another three or four years and I was 26 or so. I was out after a night of bar hopping and a couple and I decided to get chicken at a late night spot everyone goes to after the bars close. And while I was there, I was approached by a guy who recognized me. I didn't recognize him at first, but then realized that it was an old friend, Brandon. We were friends at that time and we both worked for him. Last I heard, he had a bad heroin addiction and the rumors were certainly true because I could barely recognize him. He was happy to see me though and asked if I could spare a few bucks or a cigarette, then asked if I could give him a ride to where he was staying. Brandon said that he was abandoned and needed to get back up with his friend in NH and I really didn't want to but he was insistent and wouldn't stop asking despite my body language and what I assume was a distasteful look on my face as well but in the end I agreed. I needed to get my car so I took his number down and told him that I would call him when I was outside. He didn't believe me and kept begging that I don't ditch him and honestly looking back I kind of wish that I did. So while we were driving, I was contemplating how Brandon was going to kill me, trying to drive alert just in case he tried anything crazy. I was aggravated because I didn't want to do this and realizing more and more that we were never really friends, that I barely knew him years ago, that he was pretty much a stranger. I didn't like where this was going. But on the road, he tells me to take a left and... I get a really weird familiar sense of where we were, and I ask, Hey, where is your friend's place? Brandon replies, Did you ever meet Ryan? And honestly, every time I heard that guy's name, my mind just blew up. I literally shouted out, Wait, what? You're staying with Ryan? That guy's a fucking piece of shit pedophile who takes advantage of kids. What the fuck are you doing there? I assumed that guy was in prison already. Brandon just laughed and said, Yeah, I work with him. He's weird, but you just need to smack him up a bit and he doesn't try that weird shit on you. I was pissed and kept trying to explain to Brandon how severe this guy was and that it wasn't a small issue. But Brandon just kept shrugging it off and said many people have paid him visits and put him in hospital a few times even and something about him being kidnapped at one stage and having to pay money to families threatening to kill him. He also said that the cops have paid him multiple visits and there was a charge against him at one stage but he paid his fees and maybe on some registry but he still has everything that he had before. None of it was satisfying to hear and I wanted to hear that he was rotting in prison, or even dead. After hearing this though, I just refused to drive him all the way there and I dropped him off at the top of the street. I said good luck and I just sped off out of there. I was so angry driving home that he was still out there and even walking around. Eventually though, I got home and I just kind of passed out and slept in late. When I woke up though, I had a missed call and also a voicemail. I listen and it was Ryan. I'm assuming that Brandon told him that I gave him a ride and perhaps the things that I said. He said that I needed to call him back so that we could talk, that Brandon was in bad health and that he needed to talk to me. I was shocked and honestly a little bit scared. Hearing his voice seriously gave me chills but I paced around my apartment and eventually decided to call him back. But when I called back, I just completely lost it. I screamed at him, called him a pedophile and told him that I was actually going to kill him. I reminded him of what he did all while swearing and describing how I wanted him dead. He eventually hung up on me and I immediately blocked the number and started mentally preparing myself. I honestly thought that I had just started a war and told myself that I needed to get ready for him to come that this guy would try to kill me because I wanted to expose him. Luckily, no one ever came though and my paranoia eventually drifted off. I would move a couple of years later and can say that I've not heard anything on that name again. I also pray that I never do. Please though, the people who listen to this, if you have kids, watch out for them, hey.
There are real psychos out there, and even though you think that you're well put together, things can happen to you or the ones that you know real quickly. I was ashamed for a long time for not coming forward and doing all that I could to stop this prick. It was easiest to just kind of bury it deep and act as if it never happened. That, unfortunately, comes with consequences, and it does change you. These days, I really don't trust anyone and I make up the worst intentions for people right from the get-go. I'll never forgive him, that's for sure, and could care less if he died a painful death. I'll admit that I've grown from it and have moved on, but it still does sting a little knowing that he never faced the punishment that he deserved. My cousin and I went hiking around his property and stumbled on a fire track about an inch deep in some mud along the edge of a stream one day. Just one, so we figured that it was a wheelbarrow. But the only thing was, is that there were no footprints to indicate that there was somebody pushing the wheelbarrow. We followed the fire track and it led us into what I can only describe as a kind of cul-de-sac of cliffs. The only way out was the way that we came, or we had to climb about 45 to 60 feet. The whole area was covered in mud, and we found the wheelbarrow, but the only footprints were ours. But there was also a ton of clothes around, which was weird. All the different sizes and styles, everything ranging from kids' clothing to adult clothes, just kind of scattered everywhere. There were also a few dozen figurines carved from stone around, and some put together from tree bark. These were the only things that seemed to be positioned with care. The clothes were scattered carelessly, but the figurines were standing upright, placed atop rocks or on fallen branches. In the side of one of the cliffs was a hole, too small for us to fit in, and I was a pretty small kid at that age. And honestly, we probably wouldn't have even noticed it if not for the sound that came from it that caught our attention. It was like a, a hum, very short and followed by a click or a scratch sound. We shined our lights into the hole and saw that it must have been 30 feet back into the cliffside. The outer layer of stone was reddish brown, but the inside was grey, the same colour as the stone figurines lying around. We weren't sure how far back the hole actually went, but we had the bright idea to throw one of the figurines into the hole and see if we could get it to hit the back. So we did. I tossed it in and my cousin shined his light and we watched it bounce to the back. But the second that it reached the very back, what I can only describe is like a curled arm uncurled from some unseen crevice and snatched up the figurine and then just disappeared. We didn't see what it belonged to but the color was like a bluish gray and after it grabbed the figurine, it didn't just pull back out of view. It kind of spiraled quickly. If I had to describe it, it was kind of like a, a scorpion tail, but with a hand at the end instead of a stinger. Later on, my cousin and I brought our uncle back to the place, kind of petrified. But when we did, all the clothes were gone. Everything except the wheelbarrow and the figurines had vanished, and there were still no footprints. The hole still had a humming noise occasionally coming out of it. So my uncle called the police and we ended up meeting with them back at the house and then bringing them to this place. There were still only our footprints but now the figurines were facing the other way. This time my cousin had done the classic thing that kids do in movies. He taped a camcorder to a remote control car. The humming still came from the hole but it became a, a rapid click as the officer and my uncle looked into the hole. We eventually convinced them to let us drive the remote control back into the back of the cave and see if we could record anything back there. The hole was actually so small that it was almost too tight to fit the RC car with the camera on top of it. But it was just doable. My cousin drove it to the back of the hole, turned it right, turned it left, and then turned it around and drove it back. And we watched the footage and it goes in, it looks right, and there's nothing. It turns left... And dozens more figurines made of stoner in the back of the hole, just around the corner. All of them facing directly at the car and arranged in perfect lines. But 
Aside from that, there was nothing. No creepy creature with scorpion tail arms or anything. Just these figurines. The cops said that they would look more into it and let us know if they found anything worth telling us about. But the following morning, my cousin and I woke up to one of the figurines sitting on the edge of his dresser next to his Nintendo 64. He swears that he didn't take one. So does my uncle and I know that I didn't. So unless one of them's lying, it showed up on its own. Or it was placed there by whatever was in that hole. I work at a large crafting store in California and have been there for a year and eight months now. And last year we hired a guy and his name's Hayden. Hayden was a little quiet on the first day but quickly became more talkative and over the next couple of weeks started to pretty much never stop talking. He would constantly say weird stuff and one day he was put in charge of the building furniture. Our store carries stuff like furniture and home decor and stuff like that. He was apparently having difficulty assembling the table that he was working on and said something about cutting his wrists if he can't figure out how to put it together. Another time we were both working in the stock room and he just kept talking about how much he looked like the Parkland shooter, Nicholas Cruz. I'll admit that he did in fact look like that kid, which was really creepy. But I remember one day that I'd gotten off work and was waiting for my ride to pick me up when out of nowhere, Hayden just walked up behind me. He just stood there with an awkward smile on his face and I politely asked him, what's up? And he said something to the effect of, oh, nothing much, just enjoying my lunch break. I'm thinking about going inside Taco Bell, right across the parking lot from our work, and just shanking someone. He pretty much laughed at this and said that he was joking, but when my wife picked me up, we saw him walking towards the Taco Bell and just flashed us this creepy ass ear to ear smile. So the last straw for me though was when he and I were assigned to work our spring freight and get it loaded up on a large U-boat. Our shift started at 7am and was over at noon. It was 11 and we still hadn't finished our task because Hayden just wouldn't stop goofing around. He would also work very slowly on purpose and would only take one item to the U-boat at once. Our boss came to where we were working and was upset that we weren't done yet. He told us that we would both get ridden up if the job wasn't finished before we were off and I was pissed off at this point and Hayden knew it. He seemed to feel bad for pretty much getting me into trouble and even apologized. But he then said something that really concerned me. He said in the most serious tone that I've ever heard him speak in since meeting him, if I get fired, I'll shoot this place up. He went on to say that he knew where all the emergency exits are and would first shoot up all the cashiers and then move on to the other employees in the store as well. I'll admit that I didn't immediately report what he said, but it definitely had me on edge and I kept thinking about well, what if. After some convincing from my wife, I finally did the right thing and I informed my manager. They took a written report from me and contacted the police and after two more days of working with Hayden, he was eventually fired and subsequently arrested for his threats. The week after he got arrested, my boss held a meeting with the entire staff and told everyone what happened. After everyone left the meeting, he pulled me aside and revealed to me what the police and Hayden talked about during the interrogation. I don't completely remember what was said, but Hayden apparently admitted that he said what he said and kept asking if I had been the one who reported him. Fast forward to a few weeks ago and I was working at the same store, still am, and I was heading to the break room for my final break when I heard a voice from one of the aisles to the left. A man was standing next to the paint case and asked if I could get him some paint. While I was opening the case, he addressed me by my name, which I immediately thought was weird because I wasn't wearing my name tag on this particular day. Out of curiosity, I asked him how he knew my name and he said that it was just a lucky guess. To which I thought that was BS, mainly because his tone of voice seemed sarcastic. The entire time I was getting his paint, he was just staring at me with a smirk on his face. He then began to ask me questions about my name, which is the same name of a popular TV show character. He asked what year I was born, why my parents decided to give me that name, etc. 
At this point, I started to walk away, and as I had other things to do, and the whole time I was walking away, he was still trying to talk to me, and I heard him yelling my name from three aisles down. I went and stood in the warehouse until I thought that he was gone, and later that same day, one of my co-workers asked me if I knew the guy who was buying the paint, and I told her that I didn't. She told me that he had approached her and asked her all kinds of questions about me, like if I'm a good co-worker and if she likes me and stuff like that. This is an ongoing issue too, as he's come into the store two other times, one being yesterday during my day off and apparently asked where I was. I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this guy might be cousins with Hayden, as they sort of look alike and have similar mannerisms too. Anyway... Tonight I worked the closing shift and was outside getting carts after the store closed at 8pm when two SUVs pulled into the parking lot. One of them parked behind the store and the other one parked in the main parking lot. I was standing in front of the entrance doors when a man dressed in all black and wearing a hood stepped out of one of the SUVs. Another guy walked up next to him and they both started approaching the store. I politely told them that we were closed and when I looked down... I noticed a large baseball bat in the hoodie guy's hand. I started repeatedly ringing the bell to be let back inside, and these two guys were just pacing back and forth in the lot, staring right at me. My manager eventually let me in and called the police as well. The guys were obviously long gone by then, but I know that this could be a, a totally unrelated incident, but it's definitely suspicious for sure. I used to live in the southwest corner of Missouri in an old railroad town that had quite a few missing people here and there, mostly due to a high tweaker population. I lived in what we called a holler at the bottom of the tops of two enormous hills. A creek also ran through the holler but was mostly dry throughout the year. Despite it being dry though, living in what was basically a ravine makes the land and the hills damp and also misty which meant that the woods surrounding our trailer were perpetually green year-round and also thick. You could walk in one direction for 10 minutes and get lost pretty easily. Generally speaking, we kids used the creek bed for a path, as there were flat rocks along it that were easier to navigate than the viney lush forest floor. Now, one day in the middle of summer, I decided to go for a walk in the woods. As usual, our red-nosed pit bull, Fatty, came along and... The sun would be setting soon, but I was home alone a lot of that time, so there was no one around to tell me not to go. I figured that I had enough time before sunset to walk a certain point and back. It was 7.30 and the sun set around 9 at that point in the summer. But the minute that I started trekking it throughout the creek bed, my pit bull started whining really weirdly. He didn't leave my side once, but was definitely reluctant to follow, stopping here and there to smell the air, looking behind us. And I figured that maybe there was an animal in the area, so I didn't worry too much. There was a point in the creek bed, though, that I had to duck under two fallen trees. It made a sort of bridge in the middle of the creek and acted as a turnaround point for most of my walks. My dog was still whining, and I began to wonder if there was a cougar or even a bear in the area, but for some reason I wanted to just keep walking. I ducked under the trees, shushed fatty, and stopped to listen to the woods surrounding us. I heard nothing. I mean, I heard literally nothing. No wind, no snapping twigs, not even any birds, which was kind of weird. Even on calm days with no wind, those woods were usually teeming with sounds of life. And I mean, nothing was ever still, but all of a sudden, now it was. It also made my stomach feel like I was dropping down into a pit. Then, I began to feel really weird. I can't really describe it, but it was kind of a gut feeling, when suddenly my body felt very queasy and oversensitive, and worse, I had the distinct feeling that now I was being watched. I have felt similar feelings when being watched by a bear at some point, and it's always really weird, but something just tells you to get the hell out of Dodge when there's a huge animal nearby. Humans are animals after all, and we also get those instincts. And every time that I'd experienced an animal that could potentially hurt me in the woods, i had immediately turned around and gone home. But my dog had always alerted me by barking or growling, but for some reason, not this time. 
Instead, Fatty was scared and trembling. Now, I'd seen this dog get hit by a truck before and get up like nothing had happened, and this time, he was terrified. All signs were pointing to leaving, right? But no, another weird thing happened. Call it uh, an edgy teenager or anything you want, but I felt this strange pull into the woods. There was no sound, but I felt like something was calling me, luring me deeper into the woods. It was the worst part of that day, and also the creepiest thing that I had ever felt. But I was also curious, so I wanted to know what the hell wanted me to wander further ahead. I walked forward, aware that my dog had firmly planted himself at the fallen trees. He was shaking all over and yelped at me as I walked away, but he didn't come with me. He also didn't leave, which I believe potentially saved my ass that day. But I left Fatty behind and eventually got to the part of the creek that I'd never been to. It was a clearing with a ring of trees surrounding it, with the creek stretching far ahead and going around an unseen corner. But the sun hadn't moved and it was still silent. I stood in place for maybe a minute, I think, and considered turning around. But the clearing was creepy and felt kind of devoid of everything. I can't really explain it well enough, but I felt like if I walked around that corner, which was about 100 feet away, that something terrible was about to happen. It felt like something was just waiting for me to walk into it, unsuspecting. In the end, I brushed it off as paranoia. I mean, I had plenty of sunlight left, and I could explore alone for once, and besides, if something was drawing me further in, then it's also possible that I might find something amazing. So I took a couple of more steps and suddenly I heard my dog yelping frantically behind me. Startled, I turned around quickly, my dog looking like a little white speck far back into the trees. He was pacing back and forth at his spot and barking like it was going to kill him if he didn't take off running. He kept lunging forward but wouldn't move any distance forward. That was when I realized that something was just very wrong. I turned around again to look back at the clearing, and all of a sudden, it was pitch black outside. Like, seconds ago, the sun wasn't even close to going down below the horizon, and all of a sudden, now the stars were out. No sun, no light. I stared hard at the trees around the corner, seeing nothing but elongated shadows. I heard a twig snap when all of a sudden my ears just started to ring and panic flooded my entire body. I whipped around and shot back towards the fallen trees, sprinting towards my dog. He was snarling and barking like mad, and when I ducked under the trees, both of us sprinted back towards the house. The entire time, I honestly felt like death was on my heels, and Fatty never once ran ahead of me, staying right at my side the entire way back. When we eventually made it back home, I quickly checked the clock, and during the walk that usually took about uh, 10 minutes, I would say, I had been gone for three hours. I had left my home at 7.30, and now it was 10.30, which meant that my parents were due home in an hour. The next day, I walked only part way back to where I could see the clearing. The very farthest that I could walk was about two miles, and so that meant that it took me three hours to walk there and back. To this day, I have never felt so prowled upon in the woods as well. These woods weren't part of a national park or anything, but if you walked about 10 miles or so, you could reach Mark Twain National Park. And people go missing there quite often, seeing as the woods can be impossible to navigate after dark, and it has large hollows in the middle of the woods that people go rolling into and they get stuck as well. I don't know what wanted me in that woods that day, I didn't see what it was and it didn't say anything, but I ignored every natural instinct that I had to run until it was almost too late. My dog being there may have just been the reason too that I didn't wander deeper into the woods of the Missouri and succumb to someone or something in that dark place. I've never told anyone in my walking life about this and what do you guys think? Have any of you guys heard of the 411 cases involving Missouri Woods and hollers and whatnot? Or do any of you guys have any similar experiences if you're from this area?
This took place around two years ago. I was driving to work, a five hour drive, it was already dark. About three hours of driving and I started to get tired. So I bought myself a coffee and some snacks at a gas station and so I went on. But snacks and coffee can only keep you awake for so long and I started to feel tired again. This part of the road was nothing but thick dark pine wood forest around me. No other cars on the road. Nothing. Only insects smashing my windshield now and then and an empty road. I was now extremely tired and at one point I even nearly drove off the road for almost falling asleep. I thought to myself that I have to sleep now and I can't wait for a gas station. I need to stop as soon as I see a place where I can park my car and just get something. When I'm tired too, I unfortunately fall asleep really fast. If I'm tired enough, I can fall asleep in the middle of a sentence even, when I'm talking. So it's a bit urgent for me to find a place where I can stop now. It felt like maybe an hour, but probably just like five minutes go by and I spot this little pocket in the road. It's like a parking space for quick stops, like peeing, switching drivers, or stuff like that. Not even a real resting area. But I stopped here, turned down my windows to check if I heard any weird noises, and there was total silence. So I wind up my windows again. I thought to myself that nothing bad was going to happen. I haven't seen a car for like 30 minutes, in fact. The road is empty. And if someone is checking out my car, I bet it's the cops checking on me if I'm alright. So, I leave my keys in the ignition and I lock the doors just to be safe. I adjust my seatbelt to make it more comfortable to sleep in and I take off my shoes and I put them on the passenger seat on the right. And let me tell you that it was so nice to close my eyes and instantly I fall asleep. I don't know why, but something wakes me up. I can't really see anything. Some kind of bright light hits me in the eyes. At first I thought that it was a flashlight, but... Then I realized it was the high beams from another car in my rearview mirror that was blinding me. I look at my left mirror and I see a dude walking up beside my car. Maybe he wants help with something? Should I make it clear to him that I'm in here? He's right beside my left back door now. Should I step out and ask what he's doing? I didn't have to in the end because the dude proceeds to jerk and pull on my left back door. I almost crap my pants when I realized that... He's trying to force his way into my car. My seat is adjusted for me to lay down and I push it back max. I can't reach the pedals which makes it impossible for me to drive my car. But I slam the car horn and it breaks the silence with a roar and the dude jumps. And that gives me like two seconds to push my seat to reach the pedals. But it's still way out of adjustment so I'm kind of pulling myself to the steering wheel because my seat is laying flat and isn't supporting my back. But anyway, I quickly start my car and I drive off with a cloud of smoke from my screeching tires. It's actually quite surprising just how hard it is driving a car with nothing holding up your upper body, but I managed and I got out of there. As I leave though, I look in the rearview mirror and I see how the dude stands there and just looks at me. And then I see two more guys coming up beside him. What I can make out too from the silhouette of their beams was that one of them has something in his hand, like a wrench or a crowbar or something. After that, I drove super fast, way over the speed limit. My whole body was trembling with adrenaline and fear, and I drove like that for like 30 minutes. Then I stopped at the gas station to fix my seat and put my shoes on again. I figured out too that I must have been only sleeping for like 10 minutes max. And well, after that... I didn't have to sleep until I got to my destination, which is surrounded by heavy duty fencing and the building has an alarm. I told my boss the next day as well and he said that they actually have problems with what we call it in Sweden, road pirates. Criminals that force you to stop on the road and rob you of everything, including your car sometimes. And apparently that specific area is known for it. I'm not saying that it was that. I mean, it could have just been three nice guys that wanted to check if I was okay. But then, why didn't they just knock on my driver's window? The thing in his hand could have just been a big flashlight, I suppose, but still, I think I dodged a bullet with that one. A few months back, I went on a date with a guy who seemed familiar to me, but I just couldn't put my finger on where I'd seen him before. 
I assumed that I might have met him on a night out or something. It was a last minute thing though, and I told him how I wasn't looking for anything, but it would be nice to hang out. And that was a mistake. When I met him, at first he seemed like an alright guy, but things quickly turned when we got to a restaurant. He didn't order, but I did, and he started saying things about loving my curves and my body. I laughed it off, but I thought that he was being a bit too forward. He could have put it nicely or kept that to himself. While having my food, he began telling me about how I was different from other girls because they don't give nice guys like him a chance. Red flags were immediately going off, so I came up with a story that I could only be out for a little bit because my parents wanted me to dog sit and stuff like that. He bought it, but then proceeded to stare at my breasts and say things about how he wished he could see me without clothes on even saying that I should send him a picture. I told him that I don't do that and that he was making me uncomfortable. He stopped but then told me how he brought me a gift. He pulled out of his bag a bouquet of roses, which I did think was actually quite sweet, and a bag of Tesco prawns. That confused me and honestly, I just kind of burst out laughing. I asked why he got them and he said that he knew that I liked tempura and prawns. But the thing is, is that I never once told him that I did, so alarm bells were definitely going off again. My head was now telling me to run, but I didn't want to be rude, so I stayed until the time that I said I would, and after that I left. So I had less than an hour left. He kept talking too, but he actually started to scare me because he started guessing aspects of my life, like uncannily, like the school that I went to, what I was like as a kid... What I'm currently doing, he just got every part right. It scared me because, well, I haven't told him any of this and I haven't posted any of this online. So I backed away and asked him how he knew all of that. And it turns out that his mother was actually one of my teachers in school. And he asked her everything that she knew about me and looked online for anything about me currently. I don't know when he asked her, but at this point, I definitely wanted to get out of there. And thank God for my mum. Not long after, I got a text from my mum asking how things were. He didn't see the text but saw that it was my mum and I just said, Oh my goodness, my mum and dad got the times wrong for the pictures so I have to go home now for my dog. I'm so sorry. The guy just accepted that and then started to walk me home. I said something about only going about halfway because I'm not comfortable with people knowing where I stay. But he then started insisting. And he then dropped the bombshell that he knew that I stayed on X road, but didn't know which house was mine. I told him that that was really weird and that it creeped me out that he knew that. He claimed that I told him, but I never tell people that. So I started to walk to the main road for my own safety, but he then grabbed my hand and said that he knew a shortcut. I was getting really scared when he stopped and shoved his tongue down my throat I shoved him away and told him to stop it, and he apologized. That's when I noticed a stranger walking a dog coming, so I used that as an opportunity and said that I needed to go, and I went to the main road. I thought that I was safe, honestly, but I wasn't. The guy kept walking with me, and I stopped and told him that I wanted to part ways here and how it was nice to meet him again. He then looked confused and said that we had never met. He said something about meeting on a night out just to get me to come with him and I then began saying, look, I have to go, when he cut me off, grabbed me and pulled me near some bushes saying, before you go, there's one more thing. I told him that I needed to go and to let go of me but he just ignored me. The guy then pulled me in, hurting my wrists, and kissed me again. He saw the bushes and said about having privacy and I managed to shove him off and tell him no. He then grabbed me again and tried to take me to the bushes saying it'll only take a second while I resisted. Some dog walkers came by and he stopped and pulled me to kiss me again but this time he grabbed my breast and I shoved and screamed. I said no and just ran. My heart was racing and I was terrified. I thought that he might have tried to do something to me. I kept looking back but he was nowhere to be seen. I ended up taking the long way home just in case that night. And when I got in, I just started to cry because I thought something bad was going to happen to me when I got a message from another account because it was him. 
He said about how lovely it was meeting me and how it was the best date ever, how I was the prettiest girl that he'd ever kissed and that he would love to see me again, adding how he hoped that I had a lovely time too and that he showed that he was a gentleman, then adding that he was now on my road. I just hit on the floor for the rest of the day after that, and when I looked at his profile, I actually remembered where I'd seen him before at that moment. He used to message my old Facebook account years ago with weird messages and creepy edits saying how he liked me. This whole event happened within an hour and a half, but boy, did it feel a lot longer than that. I was vacuuming my house at 9.30pm with my music playing when I get a knock on my door. My boyfriend was at work and I was not expecting company, especially so late at night. So I turn my music down and realize that the door is actually not locked. Instantly, I'm terrified. I mean, I'm only 4'10", so I had to prop myself up to the wall to look through the people and I carefully lock the door more pounding and the man outside my door is no one that I recognize and looks kind of disgruntled, dirty and quite frightening. He was short and stocky and looked angry. He grew frustrated knowing that I just turned my music down. He heard me lock the door and started calling out, ma'am, more knocking, excuse me ma'am. But how did he know that I was a woman? I looked around the room and see my blinds were open and realized that he must have been watching me vacuum. Thankfully, my neighbors right across from me opened their doors, and the husband asked, Hey, excuse me, who are you and what are you doing? Startled now, the creep fumbles and says, Oh, good evening, sir. I was just going to offer my carpet cleaning services to her. The husband goes, That's great, buddy. She doesn't want it. You need to leave, right now. And the creep left promptly. Afterwards, I called the police, my boyfriend, and closed up my blinds and texted the neighbors to thank them for scaring him away. I paid extra to live on the top floor as well, but it seems that this creep must have been watching me from below. This story takes place during my senior year of high school when I still lived at home with my mum. It was a Saturday, so I slept in as any teenager does, and my mum, she left for work early that morning, so I spent my day at home alone. I decided to do some cleaning around the house when I realised that we were out of paper towels, so I went down to the garage to get them, that's where we kept extra things. My mum lives in a three-storey townhouse where the main floor is actually on the second floor, and the first floor is just a, a small entryway at the bottom of the stairs and two doors. One of them is the front door and the other leads to the garage. So I walked down the stairs and opened the door to the garage, going to flip on the lights, but realizing that I didn't need to, because the garage door was wide open and letting in a lot of daylight. Now, maybe to some this would be no big deal, but my mum lives in a not great part of town and is adamant about closing the garage door when she leaves. I remember feeling weird too about it since it was so unusual but chalked it up to my mum just not realising it or maybe something had rolled under the door so the automatic sensor kept it from closing completely and she drove away without realising. I looked over into the dark corner of the garage where the boxes were stacked and the paper towels were stored. For some reason I couldn't get myself to walk over there and grab them. I do have a slight fear of the dark, so I figured that that was what was causing my sudden hesitation. So I just kind of stood there in the doorway and pressed the garage door button on the wall and watched it close completely. I made sure nothing blocked it from closing and I waited a good 10 seconds before leaving to make sure that it was really shut this time. I switched off the light, walked back inside and locked the garage door. I took maybe two steps up the stairs before... I heard boxes trembling and scuffling of feet and the audible sound of someone hitting their hand against the garage door opener and then the mechanical sound of the garage door opening. And at that, I noped it up the rest of the flight of stairs and then just stood at the top step for probably 20 minutes, just kind of shaking. It wasn't until my mum got home asking me why the garage door was open that I went back down there. And other than my mum's car now in the garage... It was completely empty, except for the boxes in the corner where we store extra things for the house. 
I looked and saw that the boxes were toppled over. I had to explain to my mum the situation and I'm so glad that my gut told me not to go into that dark corner of my garage and to whoever decided to creep in there, please never come back. When I was 13, I had not long broken up with this girl who supposedly had a psycho family. But one of this girl's family was a close friend who was supposedly obsessed with her. I was invited out with my friends after school one day and this boy latched on. Everybody told me to come out and that he wanted to make amends and he understood why I did what I did, etc, etc. Being the pushover that I am, I went out and we hung out in the parks and smoked and drank and whatnot. As it started to get dark, I decided to go home, and I felt uneasy about being around him, and he started acting all weird, talking about fights that he'd been in, and bragging about bashing some guy's face in with his fists in school. And so, because I didn't feel safe whatsoever, I just left. Now, the next day, my best friend and all the other kids that were out that night came into school and told me that it got worse after I left. Apparently, after they had drunk some more, he started waving this huge kitchen knife around. It was telling everybody how he was going to stab me in the stomach for breaking that girl's heart. Now, let me point out too that I only know the details of this because I have a relative in the local police force. In the end, my dad made us move too because he actually knew where I lived. I continued getting death threats on social media though until about a year or two later when it was in the paper. It was spread around town that he had broken into somebody's house and stabbed a man to death, and then slid his wrists in the man's bathtub. They found high amounts of cocaine and cannabis in his system, along with a, a lot of alcohol. The elderly neighbors phoned the police when they heard some commotion, and they hadn't seen the man leave for work that day. And they found him barely conscious, and he's now in a psych ward. This was also supposedly over this girl again. Anyway, I think that... I dodged a big bullet there. I have a handful of little encounters that I just can't explain, starting from when I was around seven. So, the earliest one I can remember is waking up in the middle of the night and seeing a rapidly fading hand on my shoulder. I remember feeling something heavy on my shoulder and when I turned around I saw the faint image of a hand resting on my shoulder as though someone was actually standing behind me even though I was laying on my back. I turned my bedside lamp on and I sat up staring around my room for a long time before eventually just falling asleep with the light on. The next one was uh, about a year or so later I think, maybe more I can't be sure but I was lying in bed trying to sleep and I remember feeling something tugging at my blanket from the foot of my bed. It was hard enough too that I kept sitting up and turning my lamp on to see if anyone was there. I even looked under my bed at one point. After I'd sat up for about half an hour staring at the end of my bed, I laid back down and as soon as I did, as I turned the light off, I felt the tug again. I woke my dad up and he slept in my bed that night while I slept next to my mum. And he said that he slept fine. The next one, nothing physically happened, but for some reason I just couldn't shake the feeling like I felt like someone was in my room. The room just seemed small and dense and crowded, even though I was the only one in it. It bothered me enough too that I told my mum and she smudged my room and sat with me for a while. The next was uh, about a week after that. It was a warm night, so I had my window open and I woke up and... There were just a lot of flies in my room, so I got up and closed my window. And when I sat back on my bed, the window was a little bit open again. I stared at it in case it moved again, and it actually started to move open again on its own. It moved up another inch or so by itself, and at that point, I ran out of my room and slept next to my parents. After that one too, things started to pick up a little I had a big plush wolf that my brother actually wanted a fair at one point and it sat in my room against the wall farthest from my bed, a good six feet or so away. I woke up one morning at dawn and the wolf was now at the foot of my bed. When I was laying down too, I could just see its beady little eyes poking over the top of the quilt and I still don't know how it moved across my room like that, but 
It scared me so bad that my mum gave it to Goodwill that afternoon because she just refused to have it in the house. Another time too, I was sleeping on the couch in the living room while my mum was busy with something. I slept there for three days and every night I would feel someone walking past me. I pretended to be asleep but I narrowly opened my eyes and could never see anyone, even though I'm sure that I could feel someone there. But one night, the video recorder kept turning on by itself too, and i turned turn it back off and it would turn back on again. But the last thing I encountered was another sleep one, and it was when I was about 19. I still remember the dream too, because I was walking home from my elementary school and was being followed by someone, but they were always just too far away to make out any features. I made it back to my house and nobody was home. In my dream, I laid down on the couch and then the whole house was just engulfed in flames and the guy who followed me home was standing in the fire. I woke up really abruptly to this and I saw the head and shoulders of a, an oldish man standing over my bed. It took maybe 15 seconds or so before it faded, but it was vivid enough that I actually said, who's there, out loud. I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis too because I could definitely move. Nothing ever happened after that, and I've moved out now. A few years after I moved out, though, they pulled up the carpet in my brother's room and found what looked like the ruins of a wine cellar under a trapdoor in the floor. But it had a little box of curious things from the 50s and the 60s in it, and some scraps of comic strips like it was used as a, a cubby at some point. Anyway, I never found any more information on it, but I'll never forget those nights that I was living there. So this happened when I was in high school several decades ago. At the time, I had zero interest in anything paranormal. I was heavy into science and all things logical, really. And anyway, in the 11th grade, I switched high schools to one closer to home. On the second or third day there, a student walked up to me that I didn't know and introduced himself. I was new and he was cool to me, so we made friends right away. So we started hanging out, me and his other friend, who was also a nice guy. We were kids just doing normal teenager stuff, but one evening while hanging out at my friend's house and listening to some music, he told me that he knew that I was coming to their school. Intrigued, I asked how he knew that, and he said that their Ouija board told them that I was coming. I asked how long ago I told them that, and even though I don't remember his exact reply, I remember that it was longer than even I knew that I was going to change schools, which was odd. But naturally, I'm in complete disbelief about any of this Ouija board nonsense and we even told him that. So, him and his friend pulled it out and started using it in front of me. Now, understand that they're sitting on this bed using it. I'm on the other side of the room sitting down and he asks me to ask it something. So, determined to show them just how silly this Ouija board nonsense was, I began asking it questions that these two would absolutely have no way of knowing. They were deeply specific things about my family, dates, names, places, etc. This was before the internet as well, and these were just normal teenagers like myself, so I know that they didn't know this information. Since I wasn't even close to it, and they were the ones touching it, I thought that I would totally trip it up. But, to my astonishment, it actually answered every single question that I posed to it with 100% accuracy. Which, let me tell you, was absolutely impossible. My friends kept looking up at me when it would answer to gauge my reaction, and I remember getting goosebumps just all over my body. I couldn't believe that this was actually happening, but somehow, there was something behind that device that knew just all that stuff about me. To this day, I still wonder about it, and what it was, how it knew, especially how it knew that... I would change schools before even I did. To this day, I still won't allow one in my house. I don't know what force is behind them, but I think it's for the best to just leave them alone. This happened about a week ago. I was going to a gothic fair in a place that I didn't really know well, but it was in my city, so I thought that I was going to be okay. Now, for context, yes, I'm a 20-year-old woman walking alone. 
It sounds like an easy target, I know, but this happened at 4pm in the middle of summer. It was broad daylight, and even though it wasn't crowded, there were definitely people around. So I got out of the subway, and I started checking my phone for directions, but I quickly put it away in my bag so I don't look distracted or get it taken from my hands and stuff. I had actually had a phone stolen that way before. I started walking while checking the street names and numbers when a couple, they must have been around 35 years old, approached me and asked for directions. I told them that I was lost too and they said that they weren't from here either and asked where I lived. I'm not stupid so I gave them some sort of a vague answer and then I left. But two minutes after that, they approached me again and told me where the fair that I was going to was located and I said thanks and I started walking that way. As I walked, they followed me and tried to start a conversation. I tried to walk faster and leave them behind because I don't trust strangers, but they just kept going with me. At some point too, the conversation, it was only the man talking to me, shifted to jobs and occupations and the man said, I do have a job, but most of the time it isn't enough, so I have to do what I do. Usually I'm not violent, but I have a gun to use with dumb people who scream or make a scene. And then said, now show me if you value more your life or material things. He obviously expected me to hand my bag over, but, and I know that this is going to sound so edgy, but I'm deeply depressed and my train of thought went straight to, I either hand over my hard work for money that I was excited to spend in nice things today, or I finally die. I acted calm, although my heart was beating fast and I was sweating, I didn't scream, I didn't hand over my stuff either, and instead I just took my bottle of water and took a sip and then I just kept walking, thinking that it wouldn't be all too bad to get shot and die there. And they just kind of stood there confused and after a while they left. In the end too, I ended up going to the fair and I had a nice time. Once when I was about 12 years old, I woke up in the middle of the night needing to take a leak. I walked across the hall to the little bathroom, hit the lights and was about to reach for the toilet when I glanced up and saw a, a face in the mirror and it wasn't mine. It was as if someone was on the other side standing to the right with their face right next to the glass staring at me. I only saw it for the briefest moment but it's forever seared into my mind. I screamed and ran out of there to find my dad. And of course, my dad investigated and calmed me down or tried to. Eventually, we had a prayer session because I was so freaked out. And I must have gone back to sleep at some stage. Fast forward to my 30s, I'd forgotten all about the event. One night while visiting, my dad quietly brings it up and he says... Hey, do you remember that one time that you saw the face in the mirror? It suddenly came back to me in a rush of memory, sending a chill down my spine. Yeah, I remember that. Well, he said, I sometimes think about that night. He looked down at the floor with a serious expression. Because uh, I saw it too. He went on to describe exactly what I'd seen, and we still have no idea what it was. Apparently when he investigated, he saw it and had a freak out of his own. Apparently the prayer session was as much for his own nerves as mine. And I respect him for keeping that tidbit from me to my 30s, but I kind of wish that he never had told me. This happened within the last 24 hours. So I live in a large city in the US... And like many people, I've taken it on myself to try and get back in shape during the new year, so I've recently got into running and lifting five days a week. Yesterday was a run day for me, and I usually start at my apartment and cross over to this long park that runs the river close to my apartment. The park is filled with sports fields, tennis courts, and many runners along the pathway too. I've been going two or three times a week for just over a month now. So... I was on my run last night listening to a podcast minding my own business and decided to go a little further than I normally do. 
to this kind of longer stretch where the park sort of ends for like a half mile before it picks back up again. Kind of uh, an area where they park equipment. Many people avoid this area due to it kind of being not waterfront and kind of ugly. But I decided to run to the end of this area before circling back home. As I'm running, I see a man, 200 or feet so ahead of me, kind of walking in my direction. Not unusual at all. I've passed like 40 people already. But this area is empty except him and I, as most people circle back. Still though, I ride my bike here to commute for work and have never gotten weird vibes. I'm also an average built man and feel pretty secure most places in my relatively safe neighborhood. So, I keep running, listening to my podcast, when I notice the man's path is directly in line with me. As in, if I continue 150 more feet, I would dead set run into him. So, I shift to the other side of the path, 10 or so feet, keep running, not paying attention. Looking back up now, and he's in my path again. Still no alarms because, well, maybe he shifted to get out of my way too and we did that thing where you kind of walk into each other almost. So I shift back to the side that I started on and this time I watch him and he shifts to my side. I'm thinking this guy must be messing with me. I'm 50 feet away now and between there and 20 feet I keep shifting more and more quickly and he follows me exactly to the point that... He's sidestepping instead of moving forward, waiting for me to reach him. At this point, I take his presence in. He's 6'3 at the shortest, in jeans and black hoodie with a hood up. Can't really make out his face due to a streetlight behind him casting a shadow, but I begin to realize, oh shit. I come to a stop and go to pull my headphones out and begin the sentence, what the hell's up, man? I get to the what the hell part when... He raises both arms above his head and begins to scream at me. No legible words that I can hear over my podcast at least and I do notice that he has something long and white or beige in his hands. And at this point, I begin to backtrack, keeping eyes on him. All of a sudden, he dashes towards me running with his arms stretched out to grab me. I turn and hightail it the other way. It should be known too that I'm not in the best shape at this point. I've had numerous injuries requiring surgeries and I've just done about 75% of my intended run for the night. But I can tell you that I've never run faster. He kept pace though and closed much of the distance, but when we started going slight uphill, I continued to make ground. We came to a fork in the path after about a minute of this. The two paths circled around a fenced-in area that contained a construction vehicle or mowers, etc., and I made it look like I was going one way and at the very last moment, dashed the other way. The paths kind of made a circle so I was able to get far enough ahead to where he couldn't see me via the fence and bushes. And when I felt like it was my chance, I dove into a bush, clawed my way under the fence and crawled through the space and out the other side of the fence. He kept looking for me in the bushes, prowling back and forth and finally saw me on the other side of the enclosure. And at this point... I was already on the phone with the police trying to get help as gulped down breaths of air were continuing. I was also warning other runners and he eventually just followed my pace opposite side of the fence. He kept ducking into darker areas around the enclosure and eventually I just lost sight of him. I began getting worried again and kept wandering around warning people while I was waiting on the cops. After about 15 minutes of not seeing him I just pieced the hell out of there as the cops said that they were close. The jog home was horrible and any time a runner passed me I would have a mini panic attack. I was kind of in shock I think and running off adrenaline the remainder of the night. I'm not really sure what happened or what was going on. It felt like it was something from a, a movie. Today I checked the Citizen app and Twitter to see if anything had happened and I'm not sure if it's related. It most likely isn't, but five hours after I called the cops, they pulled the body of a man out of the river a mile or two downriver from where the attempted attack initially occurred. This is something that I share with new people that I meet sometimes, but obviously no one believes me. My family moved to a new house in 2011. I was 17 or 18 years old at the time. 
It's one of the first houses built in town, and it's very old. We found newspapers, in fact, dating back to events of Russian Revolution. And yes, I live in Russia. I must say that the house itself has different extensions built much later, and basically, the oldest wooden part of the house is right in the middle. The part of the house that we own, or rather I should say apartment, we've only one wooden room on the first floor. When we moved in, I decided to choose that oldest said room, and I remember feeling like I just wasn't welcome there from the very first day. Quite honestly too, I really didn't put much thought into it at first, but it very quickly got very spooky. So, I remember seeing objects move on their own, a rope crawling on its own underneath my bed while I sat on it, footsteps at night, weird buzzing sounds that I once recorded on a camera, and once I witnessed a sheet of paper stealthily crawl from the top surface of the desk to drawers as I was sitting in it. It was evening and the desk lamp was on, but it didn't spook me too much, but it kind of made me indignant, like, what the hell? Is this for real? I grabbed that sheet of paper from whatever force was holding it, and I just kind of chuckled in disbelief. But each day it just got a little more terrifying. And the two worst events that I remember go as follows. So, it's midnight, and I'm in bed, just trying to fall asleep. And something's bothering me, and I feel eyes on me, but my own eyes are closed. I decided to open them, and I shit you not that there's a floating face of a man right above my bed. Thick eyebrows, angry expression, just a head staring at me and no body. We locked eyes for a minute in silence, and I was too afraid to move. Eventually, though, I forced myself to rush out of the room, and that night, I slept with my mum like I was five years old again. And the second one, I was actually having a dream, and I can't recall all the details, but all I remember is it was about a kid. A kid around eight years old, I think. Skinny, light blue top, and dark blue shorts. I remember drawing it at the time, too, because the dream just felt really surreal, and... Anyway, I suddenly woke up, and I thought to myself, it must be around 3am, and I decided to check my phone to see if I was right, and... The moment that I flinched, I heard loud and clear someone running away from my bed towards the hall. Luckily, eventually I moved to the second floor, but it was probably the scariest year of my life. It seems like whatever it was, it kind of deliberately avoids newer parts of the house and for some reason sticks with the old. I don't know, but nobody lives in that room anymore and it's just a bit of a guest room now, so... I guess that whatever's in there might be happy now. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but never had been. The spot that we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail or camp spot as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs. My family has not been going to this spot for about six years now and my friends had introduced me about ten or so years. But we went for a weekend trip and I'm glad that we didn't go any longer. When we got there, everything was going well except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to our campsite, but they were just kind of stargazing and ended up leaving at some point. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to occur. At first it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as it just kind of kept going. After a while we both kind of got a little bit scared and went into the tent to try and sleep and... That was when the laugh of the noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just all of a sudden stopped and then started again at around 3am. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went and stoked the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on the flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but when I did, I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This all went on until 6am and then stopped, and that was finally when we were able to get some rest. 
After we woke up, we checked around the campsites and didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so we just kind of packed up. But once we were packed up and good to go, I go to start my vehicle and it's just completely dead. That really freaked me out as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet, somehow, the battery just still died. I was able to get a jump from a AAA and the phone call was hard to explain and the lady who took the call didn't believe me but at the end we both just laughed at it. But after that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite and also has a cabin in the same forest, roughly 25 miles away from that campsite, about what happened and he got freaked out. He told me about two incidences which he has had, one at the campsite and one at this cabin. At the campsite he stated that one night after we had all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and when he did, he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees looking directly at him. He described them as kind of bioluminescent eyes and he flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but when he did, there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were there again looking right back at him. So he just packed up and went right to bed that night. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us, plus he wasn't sure if we would believe him. At the cabin though, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that leads into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was, had to have been at least seven feet tall, if not taller. They started shooting at it with their rifles, two 30-30s, and the eyes disappeared, but once they were done, they reappeared and were closer this time. At that point, they both freaked out and went back into the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but all of us have felt very scared when these events were happening. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thinks that it's a, a Wendigo. I really don't know what to believe about that, and... I don't know what it could be, but I haven't felt that scared since that night. This is something that I didn't realize the severity of until I was much older. So, my mum had left me and my brother home alone one day. It was midday, my brother was 12, maybe 13 or so, I think. So, I must have been around 9 years old. I was watching him play Xbox in our living room. He had his headset on talking to his friends when there was a knock from the door in our carport. I run and answer the door without looking and it's a grown man that I've never seen before. We're separated by the screen door which at the time was actually unlocked. He asks, Hey kid, are your parents home? And horror just immediately washes over me. First of all, He's knocking from the carport, which is strange in and of itself. A stranger would knock on our front door, right? Plus, our carport is empty. We only had one car and my mother had taken it. And I have a feeling that this man knows that my parents aren't home. I'm afraid, I really don't know why, but I was immediately scared. My brother in the other room comes to mind, and while I've never had a father figure, my brother has always been the one who has made me feel safe. He was the strongest person in the world to me, someone who could protect me in any situation. How most people would regard their father, I think. Anyway, I feel as though I can barely speak, and I'm wide-eyed, and I manage to stutter out eventually. Uh, no, but uh, my big brother's here. Without even a moment's pause... This man reaches for the screen door and starts to open it. And, like an act of God or divine intervention of some sort, an arm reaches out from behind me over my shoulder and grabs the door. My brother pushes past me, holding the door, forcing the man back with his presence. The man tells my brother that he was looking to buy some crappy old swing set that was in our front yard at the time. And eventually, my brother closes the door and just goes back to his headset and continues playing. I sit down as well and I just continue watching him and I don't believe we ever told our mum for some reason. 
Luckily, I never encountered this person again, and it pretty much fades from my memory. But as I got older, it did become one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. A creepy, and not so much because of what happened, but what could it? It was just really unnerving how absolutely oblivious we were to the whole situation. I like to think that the man was planning to lock me in a room, rob the place and leave, but boy, people can be really evil sometimes. So, who knows. This happened to me a couple of years ago when my now husband and I were living in a townhouse in a pretty decent area. My husband was working third shift as a corrections officer at our local corrections facility and I was working as a waitress or a bartender. It was an unusually warm night for mid-March so I took advantage and decided to take my husband's 80 pound Alaskan Malamute Siberian Husky mix on a quick walk around the neighborhood near our complex. We get to the end of the street that leads into the complex that we live in and across the street is a marathon gas station. I notice as the dog, Luke, stops to relieve himself and there's a guy across the street at the gas station with a case of beer in his hands. I have my phone out, texting a friend and looked back up to notice the guy was near the stop sign, also relieving himself on the sign. I felt really awkward and instantly put my phone away and I led Luke down the street on our path. At this point, I think this guy noticed us too and he crossed the street to where Luke and I had just been. I hear him walking a few feet behind me and just keep my head down, staring at my phone with Luke glued to my hip. After about 10 seconds, I hear this guy's steps getting closer. Luke realizes too that there's someone behind us and he stops in his tracks. Mind you, he is a big dog compared to my 5'2 self, but I can handle him pretty easily and he's very well trained by my husband. But I noticed his ears were perked up and his tail was straight up. I was glad that he was aware of the surroundings, but I still wanted to keep moving and away from this guy. I don't know, I just got a weird feeling. This guy finally catches up though, so I tighten my grip on Luke's leash and pull him closer to me and step into the grass to allow this guy to pass us and keep Luke out of his way. But does this guy keep going and pass us? No. When I thought that he was about to pass us, I started out a small apology because Luke was pulling on his leash, a little to investigate this guy, and most people did get intimidated by him just by his size. Like I said, he's a pretty big dog in my opinion. But the guy stops and just kind of stares at me for a minute. Long enough for me to smell the cigarettes and the booze rolling off of him and to notice that he's probably in his mid to late 20s, dark hair, scruffy looking and just kind of really dirty. He smiles though and then finally seems to notice Luke trying to get to him and asks, Cute dog, what's his name? Instead of making up a name, I just said Luke. He then proceeds to ask me if he can pet my dog and before I can even give him an answer, he leans down to start petting Luke's head and Luke did not like that one bit. Luke jumped at him as a warning and the guy backed up, kind of chuckling. I apologized and mentioned that he was very protective and made up a lie that he was trained as my dad's former canine unit. My dad is a software developer, by the way. But instantly, I saw this guy's face change. I don't know what to call it, but he looked a little bit put off by that. He asked me what my name was and I gave him a fake one. He then asked if I lived around here and I said that I was visiting a friend of mine for the weekend. He then made a sudden step towards me and I'm not lying when I say that I have never heard my husband's dog growl in the five years that I've been with him, but the sound that came from my dog sounded like something straight out of a horror film. Luke's hair was spiking on his spine now and he was throwing himself up on his back legs and kicking his front legs at this guy. He had put himself completely between myself and the guy and was now snapping at him. This freaked the dude out so much that he stumbled backward, nearly dropping his beer. He quickly said, Well, have a nice night, cutie. And then just stumbled off down the road. When I say my heart was pounding, it was deafening, and I grabbed Luke's leash so hard and sprinted between the buildings until I got back to my townhouse and locked all the doors and collapsed by the front door. 
Luke was in my face the whole time, kissing me and whining. Uh, this dog is the sweetest and most gentle creature that I've ever met, and hearing him growl and seeing him react the way that he did made me realize that I needed to get out of that situation at fast. Back in the 80s, my parents bought a camping trailer, and every summer, my family, mum, dad, and two brothers, we would all go camping. Often a few of my cousins and aunt would also tag along. Sometimes it would be a weekend trip, and other times we would stay for a week at a time. Most camping trips were up in NH. It was so much fun, and for most of my childhood, nothing really crazy happened at all. But one morning, I woke up and noticed that my cousin or best friend was sleeping in the same bunk as me. I didn't think much about it, but as I pushed her to let her know that I was getting up, she said, Are you really awake this time? I said, Yeah, to her strange question, and went to the front of the camper to get a drink. My mum and aunt were sitting outside the camper having coffee, and when I went out to say good morning, they said, Come talk to us. I walked outside and could tell that my mum looked upset like she'd been crying. My aunt was a bit shaky as she asked, Do you remember what happened last night? I shook my head no and listened as my aunt told me about the extremely strange night, which I do not recall whatsoever. My aunt explained that at about 2am she woke up to the door to the camper being wide open. She quickly checked the bunks and noticed that I was nowhere to be found. She woke up my mum and dad, and then my mum and dad got flashlights and started frantically searching for me outside around the immediate area. My aunt stayed behind because there were still four kids sleeping in the camper, and after a scary ten minute search, my dad finally spotted me. I walked out of the camper and into the trees about thirty feet away. It was far enough that I could not be seen unless he walked into the trees a bit, and I was just standing out there in the dark with my eyes completely open but not responding to him at all. I had no shoes, no flashlight and was wearing just shorts and a t-shirt. He said that he grabbed my hand and started walking me back to the camp and he remembers asking me, Hey, what's going on? Why in the world would you come out here on your own like that? Then I finally spoke up and said, I need to wait here dad, let's just stay here. My mum remembers that I then started crying as she and my dad let me go back to the camp. Whenever I think back to this story, I, I get a strange feeling too. Thank God that my aunt woke up when she did. It's important to know too that I've never been known to sleepwalk before or after that night since then. It truly was a, an isolated incident which could have had a very different ending had I not been so lucky. My mum was so upset too that she decided to get rid of that trailer and we didn't do much camping after that night.